all the models for both regression and classification were equally applicable to data that was first transformed via basis functions. Now in this short video I'm going to briefly remind you of the usefulness of basis functions uh, now in the classification setting, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about their limitations. And this will eventually motivate us to make learning of basis functions part of our modeling approach. And this will eventually lead to the formulation of multi-layer perceptrons or neural networks. But first things first, let's take a look at a toy example where basis functions are clearly beneficial. Now suppose we are given this two-dimensional data set. So we have uh, features, uh, like two features, can be anything, and I have two classes. And I want to separate these two classes, so one indicated in red and the other in blue, via a, a linear classification model, or maybe generalized linear classification model. Then there's no way I'm going to be able to separate uh, these two classes with just a linear um, a classifier, right? So I could draw a, a decision boundary somewhere over here um, that will classify this correctly, this correctly, but then this part won't uh, be classified correctly. And I can try out all sorts of uh, decision boundaries, but none of them uh, would work. Now this is a, a nice example of where we can use basis functions to turn this into a linear classification problem. So we can design, uh, we can pick basis functions such that uh, the data transforms in the following way, that uh, the, the blue data points can be clearly separated with a linear decision boundary from the red uh, data points. Now in this particular example, we're going to do that via Gaussian basis, basis functions, uh, where we uh, center a Gaussian function around this point over here and this point over here. Um, so let's say this Gaussian has an average or a mean value mu1 and uh, this particular one has a mean value mu2. So what does that look like? So my first feature value is going to be obtained by mapping this point x to this first basis function. And this first basis function was a, a a Gaussian basis function, so that means an exponential to the power of minus a half x minus mu 1, so the distance to the first center x minus mu 2. And then I have this uh, second basis function phi 2 of x, which essentially uh, computes the affinity or closeness of a data point x to the second mean. Okay, so that's the second basis function. It's also a Gaussian basis function. And that's how we could interpret this, right? So this uh, basis function, essentially, uh, what's happened in, inside this exponential is I'm going to compute the distance from a point x to this mu, and I'm going to pull this through this exponential. So whenever this distance is small, this exponential will have a large value. Uh, and whenever this distance is large, for example, uh, points over here have a large distance to this uh, mean, uh, then e to the power of minus something large will lead to a, a small value. Okay, so this first basis function computes the first component of my new feature vector, right? And the second basis function computes uh, the second component of my new uh, feature vector. So each data uh, point um, now gets a new location in this new feature uh, space. Okay, so let's see how this works. So we have this cluster of points. All these points, they are close to this first Gaussian uh, mean. They are close to mu1. So that means that they will have a large value um, for obtained from uh, the first basis function. So they will have a large uh, phi1 component. Uh, so large means close to 1 because the distance is close to 0. This exponential is close to 1. So it will correspond to this, this particular set of points. Now, if I focus on uh, the red cluster, so all these points, they are very close to mu2, so they will have a large uh, feature vector phi2, or far large feature value phi2, so this actually corresponds to this set of points, right? So because phi2 is very close to 1, it's because all these points are uh, close uh, to mu2. And then finally we have this set of points, these set of points, they are very far away from mu1, so they will have a value close to zero. And the distance is large, so e to the power or minus something large will bring it to zero. So we indeed see that the phi1 components of this cluster uh, takes on uh, small values. And if you compare it to the mu2 cluster, obviously these points are further away than the red point, so they will have a lower value in phi2. 
and they're about the same distance away. So this cluster is about the same distance away to this average as this cluster is. So they have about the same uh, value for the, the feature value uh, phi2. Okay, so each data point, each point x, gets mapped to a new uh, point phi of x. This is the vector obtained by stacking these basis uh, function values. And these were the points x. Okay, so now this is what we've been doing all along when we talked about uh, working with basis functions. We have an input vector x and we can transform it to a new vector space via these basis functions. And now we are going to perform classification in this new, um, well, a new vector space. And because of our clever choice of basis functions, in this particular case, they were Gaussians, we were able to uh, nicely separate the groups and now this actually enables us to work with a linear classifier, with a linear decision boundary, simply by focusing on, well, primarily, essentially, this is feature value phi2. So this essentially tells us that um, all points for which the phi2 feature value is large, those belong to the red class. So in a way, maybe I could also um, build a classifier just based on this feature vector. Uh, but in the general case, well, um, you want to use different uh, basis functions to come up with a nice decomposition of your input data. Okay, so this is a very clear advantage of basis functions, right? So with a proper choice of basis functions, we can turn this highly nonlinear classification problem in uh, essentially a linear classification problem via these uh, basis function transformations. But this already also exposes a limitation of basis functions because now I know what the data looks like. I work with 2D data, I can visualize this, I can get an impression of how my data is distributed, and I can come up with clever choices for my basis functions. But what if you go to higher dimensional uh, data sets, then it becomes very messy to make these kind of uh, visualiz visualizations and come up with, with proper, with decent choices uh, for the basis functions. Right, so um, let's just quickly go over some advantages and disadvantages of working with basis functions. Maybe first and foremost, uh, these uh, basis functions allow for, for building nonlinear mo models or nonlinear mappings from input variables to target variables through basis functions. And that's what we're doing here, right? My classify in itself is linear, but I first uh, pull my uh, input vectors x through some nonlinear function mapping um, and Okay, so essentially the whole pipeline is nonlinear in that sense with respect to X. So that allows me to build very complex uh, functions in the end. And once we've defined our basis functions then uh, the methods that we're used to work with in, uh, on the input space X, uh, they equally apply well to these new feature values. And that leads actually to the fact that we can obtain closed form solutions for least squared problems and that we still have that, uh, can work with a tractable uh, Bayesian treatment where this tractable treatment basically means that we work with, with linear uh, function mappings and such. And uh, so once, we once we've been through this nonlinear mapping, then everything else uh, can be kept simple, essentially. Now, some possible limitation of this is that uh, these basis functions, they are fixed, right? They're not learned. So I have to decide, decide on them, I have to choose them. And once I make my decision, uh, I keep them as they is. But ideally, maybe you also want to incorporate this as part of your modeling framework to also optimally select or actually learn these basis functions. Now that is an issue which we're going to solve in one of the upcoming videos when we talk about neural networks or multi-layer perceptrons. Then we consider um, the modeling of these functions uh, as part of the, the learning process itself. And another limitation is actually uh, this curse of dimensionality, right? So if my dimensionality grows, well, first of all, it makes it very complicated uh, for us to come up with choices for the basis functions. Uh, but also we want our basis functions to cover my entire space, right? Um, because we want every input point X to be mapped to some meaningful uh, new feature value. Uh, so that means, especially if you go to higher dimensionals, uh, higher dimensions, uh, we have a higher and larger and larger space to cover with basis functions. So that leads to a very rapid grow of uh, the number of basis functions. Okay, that basically covers uh, what we call the curse of dimensionality, which is also discussed in chapter one of the book of Bishop. Now, what we're going to do in the later videos, we're going to focus on this limitation that the basis functions are fixed. And we're going to actually learn this via multi-layer perceptrons.
But before we get there, we will continue uh, going over uh, the three methods for uh, classification. So discriminative methods, uh, probabilistic generative modeling, and well, next up is uh, probabilistic discriminative modeling using uh, logistic regression. When we first moved to the topic of classification uh, a couple of videos back, I said we're going to roughly adopt three strategies for classification. Uh, one was based on probabilistic generative models. Um, we covered discriminant functions. And today we're going to talk about probabilistic discriminative models, um, specifically focusing on logistic regression. Now we started this video series on classification off with going over uh, the theory of decision making. And the theory essentially told us that if we know uh, the joint probabilities, uh, the pr joint probability distribution that generated my data, so these data point pairs, right, input uh, class uh, pairs, if we know this distribution, then we know how to make our decisions. So what we then started off with, with first going over probabilistic generative models, and we call them generative because if we know this distribution, if we are able to model this distribution, then we can also draw new samples from this distribution or generate new data samples. And we performed our modeling uh, by uh, modeling the class conditional densities, so uh, the probabilities of each data point x given uh, my class uh, ck, my k class, in combination with uh, the prior class uh, probability distributions because the product of these two distributions gives us this joint but more importantly in the classification uh, setting we're interested in the posterior distribution for my class given my observation x and using the class conditional and the prior we can use Bayes rule to obtain these posterior class uh, probabilities. And from the point of view of decision making, these posterior class probabilities is the one that we're, uh, that's the thing we're interested in, right? That we want to assign a new data point to the class which really maximizes the posterior class probability. What we then did, we fully let go of this probabilistic setting and said, okay, let's just directly model uh, discriminant functions that are able to assign a new data point to a corresponding target via a function which is parameterized by a set w. And we came actually to this point of directly modeling these discriminant functions by making the observation that uh, if we model in the probabilistic generative setting my class conditionals with Gaussians with the same covariance matrix, then I end up with linear decision boundaries and linear models that essentially describe my classification behavior. So why not directly model these uh, linear uh, functions? And we did so via generalized linear functions. Um, so uh, then we, in the setting of discriminant functions, we covered two methods. Uh, we covered linear classification models obtained uh, via least squares regression, although there is had some issues related to outliers. But we also considered the perceptron, which also led to uh, a direct modeling of my decisions via uh, discriminant functions. Okay, now the third class of classification strategies, which we haven't covered yet, are uh, the class of probabilistic discriminative models. So this falls somewhere in, in between, um, well, the direct modeling of discriminant functions where we do not uh, rely on any probability theory at all, uh, somewhere in between that and the probabilistic generative methods where we really adopt a full um, parametric probabilistic uh, viewpoint on things. Uh, but since in the end for classification, we are primarily interested in these posterior class probabilities that is the thing that we are going to directly model. So the modeling becomes much more simpler if we do just this. Okay, so that will be covered today. Probabilistic generative modeling. Okay, so the setting is again, we are giving a, a data set of data points X with corresponding targets. And these targets correspond to now a binary uh, class. So I can pick one out of two classes uh, for each target. And what I'm now going to do, I'm going to formulate this classification problem directly using these basis functions. So we are given a set of useful basis functions that map these inputs x to some other feature vector of dimension m. Okay, so I'm going to create a new feature vector obtained from uh, my uh, uh, input vector x, of which the first component 
is always the constant value one. And that allowed me to um, describe any linear uh, model directly with this uh, scalar product, right? And what I'm also going to use, I'm going to use the following notation. Instead of writing phi of x every time, I'm just going to write phi. And then it should be understood that this phi still depends on my input x. Um, okay, but that simplifies notation uh, quite a bit. Okay, so what we'll now focus on is a class of probabilistic dis discriminative linear models. Uh, and with linear, I mean uh, the following, that my posterior uh, class probabilities are modeled uh, via a combination of this linear mapping followed by uh, some non-linear function, which we will call the activation function. Now, we, we have seen this, this form before, where, we, for example, we use the logistic sigmoid, and this is just a linear mapping. Um, actually, we're going to use the logistic sigmoid again, and that will lead to logistic regression. Okay, so we're going to use generalized linear models, meaning that we have this linear component over here. So, of course, my data x is already transformed in a nonlinear way, way via these basis functions, but once I've done that, I have a linear model as a function of w. And then I have this activation function, which turns this into non-linear mapping. And a second note is that I'm modeling a probability distributions here. So this mapping actually should ensure that the output values, so after pulling this through f, should take on values between 0 and 1. Okay. And then we saw in the probabilistic generative setting that uh, we could obtain these posterior distributions uh, via the class conditionals and the priors, and we took ratios between them. And that essentially allowed us to formulate the posteriors using logistic sigmoids or soft max functions in the multi-class case. But we're focusing now on, on two classes. And then we obtained models of the following form, where actually this component was replaced via uh, the log odds, right? So the, the, the log of the ratio uh, between my joint probabilities. And what we're going to now, we're going to simplify this. So instead of these log odds, we're going to define our own function. So that's sort of a loose uh, modeling aspect to it. We're just going to find some uh, model over here. And that then uh, generates a posterior uh, class probability. Okay, so as nonlinear function, we're going to use the logistic sigmoid all right, so we are going to say that models of this type are going to model my uh, class, my posterior uh, for class one, and we're talking probabilities here. So the probability for the other class is then given by one minus this probability, which is denoted with a y as a function of phi. So that equals one minus sigma w transpose phi. Okay, so we're going to use this notation y actually for our generalized linear model, like really as a function of my input phi, and it returns a value somewhere between zero and one that can be interpreted as probabilities. Okay, and since we are now considering the two class case, I can model my targets with zeros and ones, right? So I can uh, also model, in, instead of uh, defining two separate probabilities, one for class one and one for class two, I could also uh, build this uh, probability distribution of the, for the parameter t, which can take on the values zeros and one. So I'm not going to explicitly do something like say for class C is C1 or for class C is C2. I'm just going to insert this uh, variable t directly uh, because I can use it in a, with a sort of selection mechanism as we've seen before. So we have this model, which uh, models the probability for class one. So if t is one, uh, then this thing is active. And then we have one minus phi, uh, y of phi. And this thing should be active whenever t is zero. And when t is zero, this thing is inactive. Okay, so with this binary coding with ones and zeros and can directly define my posterior distribution for this random variable t, uh, instead of making two separate definitions for class one and class two. So I'm going to repeat this actually. So in the generative setting, the generative setting, we actually said that we're going to model uh, the posterior class probabilities for class one given X via the logistic sigmoid, which takes as input the log of these ratios 
the class conditional for C1 times the prior for C1. So this is essentially the joint probability for X and C1, the ratio with uh, the joint for X and C2. Right, so this was the generative setting where we were first modeling these um, class conditional distributions and the priors, and then we could obtain a posteriors via this logistic sigmoid. And it turns out that if we work with Gaussians, then this becomes a linear function of this particular form, but where the Ws were essentially defined via my parameters of the Gaussian distributions, which I used over here. And as mentioned before, now our focus is to just directly model these uh, linear decision boundaries without first modeling these um, uh, class conditionals and priors. So that simplifies our modeling approach quite a bit. And as we will see, and that's the next, and that's this slide, uh, this actually leads to the fact that I'm going to use less parameters also in my model. So also in that sense, it uh, makes it more simple, right? Because um, in this, uh, probabilistic generative setting, I said I'm going to model my class conditional via Gaussians and a class prior. Uh, now focusing on these Gaussians, how many parameters would I uh, need, for example, if my data consists of uh, vectors which are m-dimensional. Now if my vectors are m-dimensional, then these class conditional densities are m-dimensional multivariate Gaussian distribution. So each uh, mu parameter for each class, so let's just consider the per class case. So for one class, um, I need, for each of these means, I need m parameters, but then I also have these covariance matrices, right? And how many elements do these covariance matrices have? These have uh, m squared elements. So in that sense, I would need m squared parameters, though this is not fully the case because these matrices are uh, symmetric. So I do not need to define m squared unique uh, parameters, but at least it scales with m quadratically. So here we have the number of parameters that scales quadratically with m. Right, so if m becomes large, then also my number of parameters becomes large quite quickly. Uh, whereas in my logistic regression case, I'm just modeling directly uh, these w's. So that only requires me to have m parameters. So for my weight vector, I need m parameters. So that means uh, this scales linearly with my number of basis functions. Right, so this is a, a very strong case. If I'm just interesting for in classification, then it makes more sense to do uh, direct modeling of these uh, posterior uh, distributions because then, uh, well, I need way less parameters essentially. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to directly model these posterior uh, distributions via functions of this form. And this is called the logistic regression function because it takes as input this linear transformation of my feature vectors and then I'm going to pull it through this uh, logistic sigmoid. So that leads to what we call logistic regression. Okay, so I'm modeling my target via, the, via this uh, posterior class distributions. So this also means I can define a likelihood function um, given my data. So basically I can test how well um, my probability distribution describes these input output pairs. So let's do that. So we're again computing this likelihood function on all my data. And we again make the assumption that my data is IID, mean, meaning that this factorizes in the product of all these individual likelihoods. So uh, the likelihood essentially that my model, which is described via this set of weights W, um, describes this uh, input output uh, relation and the probability of uh, so the product and the probability this probability of a given target given my input xn was given by this selection mechanism so the probability for class 1 times 1 minus the probability of class 1 where this these yn's were really my uh, posterior uh, probabilities right which were in turn modeled via these sigmoids. So this generalized linear model based on the logistic sigmoids. 
Okay, and uh, from here on, I'm going to work with the short notation for the feature vector uh, for the corresponding data point xn. And I think maybe in one of the previous videos, I already made this uh, notation. It simplifies uh, things a lot. Okay, so because we were modeling my targets via uh, probability distributions, via posterior distributions, we could define a likelihood. And now we're going to optimize uh, the likelihood function. So the likelihood that my model parameters w describe this data set. And that would give me a, a, a maximum likelihood model for logistic regression. And yeah, we've then done this plenty of times. Instead of maximizing the likelihood directly, we're going to maximize the log of uh, the likelihood or actually minimizing the negative log of the likelihood. So let's see what this thing looks like. So we have minus uh, this product becomes a sum. So minus the sum over all my data points. Then we have again this, uh, these products over here, which also become a sum. So you have the product of the log of y n to the power t n, but these powers move up front using these logarithmic uh, rules. Um, plus one minus t n, so that's again this power the logarithm of y minus y n. Okay, so when I'm minimizing the negative uh, log likelihood, I'm minimizing this particular error function. And this particular error function is known as the cross entropy loss. And this terminology, so cross entropy, that also that, that, that actually has a information theoretical background. What, it, what we're actually doing here is we're measuring uh, the distance between two distributions. We have a ground truth uh, target distributions, uh, distribution consisting of these uh, ones and zeros. And I model a particular uh, distribution uh, via these uh, yn. So essentially it's a cross entropy between my ground truth and my predictive uh, distribution. But maybe for this course, it isn't too important where this terminology comes from. We're just going to call this particular loss the cross entropy loss. And it consists of this a product of my, well, ground truth probability, like really probability one for uh, class one times whatever my uh, prediction set. So ideally we also want this to be one. And also on the other hand side, we have the probability or the ground truth uh, label for my negative class times whatever my model uh, came up with. So the log of my model's uh, prediction. Okay, so whenever we have minimized this thing with respect to W, we've obtained our maximum likelihood solution for my logistic regression uh, function. Um, a quick remark here. So this is of course a function of W because these Y ends these y ends, they are still a function of w. I just use this short notation over here. But my sigmoid, uh, which takes as input my linear model described by w, uh, is labeled y n. So this is a function of w, which we are uh, minimizing. And in contrast to what we've been able to do so far, uh, so far we've been able to rewrite such error functions in a quadratic form, which we can exactly minimize, for which you can find a closed form uh, solution for the minimizer. For this problem, we cannot do this because my functions y n are a non-linear function of w. That's because the sigma is over here. Okay, so that's unfortunate, but uh, it turns out that this error, this cross entropy error is a convex function with respect to w. So that means there's only one optimal value. And if we're able to find this optimal value, then we found really the global optimum uh, for w. So really the optimal solution. And the fact that this cross entropy uh, function is convex, it's really nice because then we can just apply methods such as uh, stochastic gradient descent, which we've seen before, because it guarantees that, well, if we apply the stochastic gradient descent iterates, we move downhill this convex energy landscape and end up with our globally optimal solution. Okay, now for now, I'm not going to show that it is actually convex. Uh, you can find details about it in Bishop 4.3. Uh, point three, uh, but essentially the proof is uh, we have to compute the Hessian of this error function with respect to W and show that it is a uh, positive definite. And if this is the case, then I'm dealing with a convex function. And that means that I have only one um, global optimum. Actually, I'll, I will say something about it in one of the upcoming videos when I talk about a second order optimization algorithm to find this uh, optimal solution uh, for W. But now let's focus a bit of what this cross entropy loss uh, looks like. 
So, uh, okay, we have the cross entry loss for reference. I put it over here. So for one data sample, this is the loss, right? So actually there should be a bracket over here. So it's minus of this entire thing. So it consists of these components, right? So whenever Tn is one, so I want to predict the value of Tn is one, uh, this is my loss. And whenever my target is uh, zero, then I'm considering this other loss, but they, these were probabilities, right? So the probability for the other class is given by one minus probability for, uh, well, the first class. Okay, so now let's just focus on the case where I want to predict uh, the target t is one. So I'm focusing on this particular term and this y is my predicted probability for class one. This is what this logarithm as a function of y looks like. So on the horizontal axis is my predicted probabilities, which takes on a value between zero and one. And we're now focusing on the target is one. And we see that if my uh, predicted probability is close to zero, I have a high error. So I have a high loss. Um, so we really want to minimize, uh, reduce this error. So we want to push Y in this direction. And if I'm already close to my target, so now my prediction for the end data point is close to one and we see that this loss function is very close to zero. Okay, so this is what my loss function looks like uh, when I plot it against my predicted uh, probabilities. But it, maybe it's more interesting to plot it as a function of the linear component, as a function of this linear model uh, w phi. So my yn, my yn was sigma of w, like the logistic sigma of uh, w phi. And so if I plot it as in terms of this linear uh, function, then I get this error function. Now, why am I plotting it as a function of uh, W phi? I'm doing that because we used this model in our uh, least squares regression um, case, right? So in the least squares regression, let me write it down. In the least squares regression for classification, I assumed the model Y W transpose phi, where I used a quadratic loss, uh, my prediction y should be close to my target uh, squared. So that, that's what we did in the least squared regression case, right? And then we could also come up with linear decision boundaries, but we saw that we have actually, that outliers were penalized a lot, even though this was completely unnecessary. And it was due to the fact that this loss function was minimized around the value one, because we have this quadratic penalty that is minimized whenever my predictions are close to one. So that essentially says if this linear part um, is highly negative, well, then I have a strong penalty, that's good. But also if it's highly on the positive side of this thing, then I also push it back uh, to this one. Now, if you compare this to the logistic loss, so now I'm looking for the case. So I'm predicting here the target T is one. That's what I'm aiming for. Then I'm focusing on this model, right? So this is for T is one. I have to focus on this component. So then you see if I'm far away on, let's say this is my optimal decision boundary uh, defined by W. If I'm F point on this side, so highly negative, whereas actually I was supposed to be on this side, I have this penalty. So this is, looks a bit like a linear penalty whenever, so let me write it down. So this is like a, uh, linear penalty whenever uh, my point is mapped to the wrong side of my decision boundary. But you also see if now I'm fully on the right side of my decision boundary, let's say green is my decision boundary, uh, so that means I'm very much on this side, then I hardly penalize anything. So that's, that is a good thing. So we see that this logistic regression does not suffer from this a problem of outliers, which we saw in the, the least squares regression case. So we see that the penalty is close to zero when my input vector is mapped to the well, correct side of the decision boundary. Uh, then we see that my uh, penalty only assigns a very small value, a small penalty to it. And it also said if it's not too far away from the decision boundary, then I still assign some penalty, meaning that I'm going to push it a little bit further away from this uh, decision boundary.
Okay, so we just saw that these type of points, they form no problem for logistic regression. Okay, so this really tells us that when we're talking about classification, we want to work with logistic regression rather than least squares regression, where we essentially made this analysis via this uh, linear part of our model, uh, because in our logistic regression, I work with probabilities, which are obtained by this linear model and this logistic sigmoid, which maps all these inputs uh, to a probability between zero and one. Uh, but then if I make decisions, so my decision boundary, my decision boundary is essentially given by this probability it has to be larger than a half. Then I assign my data point to class one. And if it's smaller than a half, then it's uh, assigned to the other class. And this means that equivalently, it means that my linear model has to be larger than zero. Uh, so my decision boundary for my linear uh, model lies at the value zero. Now, and that then tells us if my um, predictions are far away from the decision boundary. So that's how we could interpret uh, these, these linear models. We saw that in the linear discriminant uh, model video. So if my points are far away from a decision boundary on the correct side, so I'm somewhere over here, I assign a low penalty. But if I'm far away on the other side, on the negative side, then I have this large penalty. And if I'm right at the boundary, uh, right at the decision boundary, I still have a penalty that pushes it that pushes it more to uh, well the, the the correct side of the boundary. Okay, so that's a bit of an ana analysis of how this loss function eventually leads to finding correct decision boundaries, even in the case of uh, outliers. Okay, so this slide wraps it up. So we have classification with logistic regression. The setting is we have a data set of input output pairs where I'm considering the, the two class case. So I could label my uh, output with the label one or zero. Um, before I do anything, I map it through a new feature factor. So each data point is mapped to a new data faction, uh, factor via basis functions. Then what I'm going to do is I, whenever I make a decision on the class, so when I'm doing classification, I'm basing my decisions on the posterior distribution for my class C1, given my observation X, and it was parameterized by a set of Ws uh, so this probability, this posterior probability is parameterized via my uh, generalized linear model with, uh, well, my weight parameters W and my nonlinear function, the logistic sigmoid. And then to obtain these optimal uh, parameters W, I'm going to minimize um, the cross entropy loss. So essentially I'm going to minimize the negative log likelihood and we can do this if I have stochastic gradient descent, for example, because the function is convex, I'm guaranteed to obtain uh, the globally optimal solution, a W star. And in one of the upcoming videos, I'm also going to consider a second method for finding this W in an even faster way than a stochastic gradient descent. So this part is coming up in the next videos. But once we have obtained such an optimal W, uh, the classification is very simple. Um, so we have a new data point X and we evaluate my logistic sigmoids with my obtained uh, values for W. And whenever this obtained probability is larger than a half, I'm going to assign it to class one. Or equivalently, if my point uh, mapped through this linear function is bigger than zero, I'm going to assign it to class one. Okay, so this simply means that my decision boundary, given my optimal uh, set of uh, parameters, is simply given by setting this linear function to zero. Okay, that summarizes uh, logistic regression. Next up, I'm going to talk about how to minimize this cross entropy loss. We just saw that logistic regression is a great choice as probabilistic discriminative model. And in contrast to regular least squares regression for classification, logistic regression properly deals with outliers. And with respect to full probabilistic generative models, uh, logistic regression is much more parameter efficient. Okay, so logistic regression is great for classification. Now let's see how we can optimize such models. So let's quickly go over the logistic regression setting. So we have this data set of input output pairs, 
where I'm considering binary targets. So I'm considering a two-class uh, classification problem, which means that I can code my targets uh, with these binary labels, a one or a zero. And this one of a, and a zero coding allows me to select uh, the proper uh, model, right? So instead of uh, specifying for each class separately, a posterior uh, probability distribution. So this would be for separately for class one, uh, the probability after observing uh, my data, I can model uh, the probability for each class in one function, meaning that if I'm interested in class one, then my T is one and I select, well, indeed the probability for class one. And if T is zero, then this thing becomes one and I'm focusing on one minus this probability, so I'm focusing on the probability for my second class. Okay, so this thing over here really is my probability for a target T given my input X and my model parameters W. So these X and W together, um, they are mapped through a probability via this logistic sigmoid function. All right, so we have this probabilistic model for the uh, posterior class probabilities and that allows us to define this overall joint likelihood function for my entire data set. So the likelihood that this entire data set was modeled via such a model uh, for the posterior class probabilities parameterized by a set of uh, parameters W. And again I'm using the notation here that this phi n is really the feature vector uh, associated with the end uh, data point. Okay, and then the popular strategy for obtaining my optimal parameters W was uh, in this probabilistic setting via maximizing uh, the log likelihood. And the log likelihood in this particular case is given via the cross entropy loss, or actually this is the negative log likelihood gives me the cross entropy loss. And now in this video, I'm going to explain how we can minimize this cross entropy loss. Now, as mentioned before, this, this error function as a function of W is convex, uh, though it has not, it does not have a closed form solution because it's nonlinear with respect uh, to W. Uh, so this makes the problem nonlinear and therefore I cannot find a closed form solution, but it is convex and that is nice. So it means that I can find the optimal, the globally optimal set of parameters W that really minimize this uh, negative log likelihood um, via uh, stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. This is my overall uh, loss, my total log likelihood given all my data points. And well, we can always apply gradient descent to go to the local or the global optimum in this case. Uh, but if my error um, splits in the sum of individual errors for each data point, then uh, this makes it a great candidate to apply stochastic gradient descent, meaning that we walk downhill this error landscape simply by taking a step along the gradient direction obtained by only inspecting one data point. So this entire loss for one data point uh, will be called the error associated with the end data point. So this is what my, looks look, uh, my loss looks like, right? So the sum over all these individual errors. Then the gradient or the stochastic gradient descent algorithm says that I'm going to find my new uh, weight parameter. So I start off with an initial set of weights and I'm going to update it by step by stepping into the negative gradient direction because that brings me downhill, that brings me down this error landscape. And my gradient was defined as the derivative with respect to all these model parameters. Uh, concatenated into a row vector. And that's why I have to apply a transpose over here because my weights are coded as a column vector. And well, we use the convention that my gradient is a row vector. That's so I have to put a transpose over there. Okay, so I'm updating my weights by taking a step uh, down um, the negative gradient uh, direction with a step size eta. And I'll give a little bit more uh, information about this eta in one of uh, the final slides. Okay, but we've seen, we have seen this recipe for stochastic gradient descent before, and it all relies on the computation of this gradient, or of this gradient over here. So let's see if we can analytically uh, compute this gradient, and if we have that, then we can insert it here, and then we have our update rule, which we can iterate. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to now look at one of these uh, components 
of uh, the gradient because if we know how to compute the gradient with respect to the jade parameter we can do this for all this for all these parameters um, so let's focus on this for now so i'm computing the derivative of my loss and this loss so i'm going to use the chain rule here so the derivative with respect to yn times the derivative of yn to wj right because my loss uh, is a function of these yn's and these yn's are in turn a function of uh, the model parameters w right so each yn was given by the logistic sigmoid of my weights with phi n so if i have to compute the derivative uh, of my error to w i can first compute the derivative of my error with respect to yn that's what i'm doing here and i'm multiplying it so this is a chain rule the derivative of yn with respect to wj okay so let's focus on the derivative of y with, of, of e with respect to y so that gives me the derivative of this thing so the derivative of the log is one over the thing inside the log so the derivative here would be minus tn over yn so recall we had this uh, minus sign over here minus because this minus also applies uh, for this term um, 1 minus tn over the derivative of this log that's 1 over yn times the derivative of the thing inside this log so i'm again using the train the chain rule here and the derivative of this thing with respect to yn is minus 1 so times minus 1 and of course this minus 1 cancels with this or it turns this into a plus so let me simplify it a little bit okay so this entire thing then still times yn uh, the derivative of yn with respect to wj okay great so i already computed this part of my uh, gradient and now i still have to focus on the derivative of yn so really my logistic sigma model with respect to wj so this is uh, what i'm going to focus on next so now we're going to apply the chain rule to this logistic sigmoid so first we compute the derivative of the logistic sigmoid with respect to its input times the derivative of my linear model uh, which is not too uh, hard and actually for the derivative of the logistic sigmoid this is actually what i uh, said a couple of videos back when i first introduced the logistic sigmoid i said it had this very nice property that the derivative of the logistic sigmoid is again an expression in terms of this function itself um, I promised this uh, expression would come in handy and well here it is we're going to use it I think I also said we're going to use uh, the chain rule a lot uh, <laughs> throughout this course and well again that's what we're doing we're con continuously uh, computing chain rules over here okay so there it is we compute the chain rule of this thing so first derivative with sigma with respect to its input so that gives me uh, this expression so let's just write it out so sigma of my linear model times 1 minus sigma of this linear model times the derivative of my linear model so phi n to um, wj because that's what we were computing right recall that the sigma of my linear model was called yn okay and then the derivative of my linear model with respect to wj that isn't too hard to show that it's going to be the jade component of uh, phi n but let me just quickly yeah let me just quickly write it out so we have the derivative of my linear model with respect to wj is given by well the derivative to wj of the sum so i'm just writing out the scalar product over here so the sum over all these uh, basis function components or feature vector components so wi times the i components of my end uh, uh, data vector and so i'm only observing this particular vari variable so w uh, j uh, whenever i equals j right so uh, this then the derivative of this entire sum is just phi n j because if i is unequal to j in the eyes of this uh, wj this is just a constant so the derivative of the constant is zero so yeah the derivative is phi of nj so we mark that let's insert this over here and then we've computed uh, 
the full derivative. So this is then, and let me write it in the form of these y n's to simplify it a bit. y n times phi n j, right? Because these sigmas were y n. Okay, so now remember why we were computing this thing it was because we com were computing the gradient, uh, or the derivative of my uh, error with respect to the j uh, weight, and then we already computed this part, and then we had to compute uh, the derivative of my logistic sigma with respect to double j, and that's what we just did. So let's just insert it then over here. Okay, so this part was computed on the previous slide, and this is what we just uh, computed. So now we're going to fill this in. So that gives me t n over y n times the derivative, which is given as follows. So that's y n one minus y n times phi n j. And we all already see that things are going to simplify because these yn's uh, cancel out. Then plus what we see over here, so that's 1 minus tn over 1 minus yn times what, what we just computed. So that's yn times 1 minus yn phi nj. And also here we recognize that this particular term cancels with this over here. Okay, so let's write this out again. So we have tn phi nj minus tn yn phi nj and then the other term plus, uh, let's see, yn phi nj minus tn phi nj. Okay, and then these terms also cancel out and what we are left with is a very simple expression for the gradient, namely yn minus tn times phi nj. Okay, so that's really nice. We computed the derivative of the jade component of this error function, and it really simplifies to uh, the error that I make on my prediction. So because this was my prediction and this is my target. So this is my error times uh, the jade component of uh, well, the basis uh, factor of the feature factor associated with data point n. Okay, so this derivative is this very simple expression over here, and that's not entirely a coincidence. Uh, there's actually nice, some nice background theory with it. Actually, it follows that if you work with generalized linear models uh, that work with a particular type of activation functions uh, called link functions, then it turns out that uh, the derivative or the gradient with respect to error always takes uh, this form. Uh, so I really encourage you to take a look at um, Bishop 4.3.6 that explains that if I take uh, the derivative of my error with respect to my uh, W parameters, I end up with this form. Because it's not just for logistic regression that if I take the, the gradient of my error that it takes this form, uh, this, also, this particular form also shows up for different classes of models. And it has to do with the fact that if I choose my activation function, activation function equal to what we call a link function, then I obtain uh, this uh, particular result. Okay, so this particular node refers to a broader interpretation of why this gradient takes on this simple form. Uh, but now let's just focus on the specific logistic regression case. Um, so this is what we did. Uh, we're going to apply stochastic gradient descent on this error function. And to do so, uh, we split this total error function into a sum of these individual errors associated with each end uh, data point. And then we simply apply gradient descent uh, by computing the gradient for each data point. And we just obtained an expression for what this gradient looked like. So the jade component of this gradient was simply given in the following form via well, the, the, the error that I make multiplied with uh, well, the jade component of my feature vector. So that means that the gradient, uh, the transpose of the gradient, so my gradient itself is a row vector and the transpose of the gradient is a vector, is simply given by multiplying this error with my input feature vector. And that then leads to the very simple update rule that my new model parameter is given via my old model parameters, uh, minus um, yn minus tn, so this is the error 
times my feature vector. And it's really beautiful to see how simple my update, update rule now is, right? It's just my old uh, weight vector and I add, well, the error times my feature vector to it. And this reminds us of what we saw in the perceptron algorithm, right? In the perceptron algorithm, we also we had a weight vector plus actually my target times um, my, my feature vector. But what we did there, we only applied this update whenever we had a misclassified point. And now we're essentially updating for every point uh, weighted with the error that we make essentially on the prediction, right? Because this was a prediction. If my target is one, I want to this thing to be close to one. It's never perfectly to one. So uh, this will become a negative value, which means I'm going to add a little bit of this vector itself. So it's sort of like a soft version of the perceptron algorithm in that sense. Okay, so what I indicated in red refers to the similarity with the perceptron algorithm, uh, but this entire thing uh, refers to the update rule of my logistic regression. Okay, so this uh, slide summarizes the recipe for stochastic gradient descent for logistic regression. So we have this energy landscape, um, which isn't quadratic, I sort of draw it quadratically, but it is convex for sure. And uh, that means we can apply gradient descent to it. And the gradient descent algorithm is as follows. So we select some initial weight, W, and we specify a particular learning rate. And what we then do is we simply work, walk uh, downhill um, this, this arrow landscape with step sizes eta in the direction of the negative gradient. And the gradient is given as follows. So that really leads to a very simple update rule. And now there's some remark. Uh, so if eta is small enough, then I'm bound to converge to my global optimum value. So I'm bound to end up here at uh, w star, so the globally optimal value. But if my uh, step size eta is too large, what is happening is that I'm, I jump, let's say over here, and um, my steps are too large, so I sort of keep skipping over the optimal value. So if eta is too large, then I may come close to my data point, uh, but uh, I will never reach this particular point. Uh, but if eta is too small, then it takes me a lot of time, a lot of time steps before I actually end up at my global optimum. Okay, so that's it. If I select my eta small enough, I'm bound to converge to my global optimum. So really the minimizer of my error landscape. And that gives me uh, an optimal, a globally optimal logistic regression model. Now what I'm going to do in the next video, I'm going to present an alternative to the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. I'm going to present a second order optimization method where a stochastic gradient descent is simply refers to, referred to as a first order opti optimization method because it is based on first order derivatives on the gradient. And uh, in the next video, we talk about a second order optimization method which converges faster to the global optimum, so with less iterations, and it also doesn't rely on picking a particular learning rate eta. In this video, I'm going to present a second order optimization scheme for finding logistic regression models. And this scheme will be called newton refson optimization. And along the way of deriving this second order optimization scheme, I will show that the logistic regression problem the logistic regression error function is actually a convex function and hence it only has one globally optimal solution. Again, a quick recap. We have data pairs, input output pairs, where the output is a binary target. So we're considering two class classification and we are going to base our prediction via a, a probabilistic discriminative model. So really we try to predict the probability of my data point um, belonging to a particular class, to class one. And uh, the probability of my data point belonging to class one is given by this logistic sigmoid function. Now, in order to obtain my optimal model parameters W, I'm going to minimize the negative log likelihood. And the negative log likelihood is given in the following form. And this thing over here is often called the cross entropy error function. Okay, and this cross-entry error function is a convex function with respect to W, 
which means uh, that it only has one globally optimal solution and we can find such a solution for example via stochastic gradient descent uh, and in this video I'm going to present a second order optimization algorithm to find our globally optimal parameters w and along the way I will show that uh, this uh, function is indeed convex by inspecting its second order derivatives. Now the approach is as follows. So this newton Revson iterative optimization scheme is in a way similar to stochastic gradient descent, uh, mainly based on the fact that uh, we have this iterative scheme where we start off with an initial guess and then we update my model parameters w at each uh, step. And now we're essentially going to make a quadratic um, estimation of my error function whereas previously uh, we used a gradient which ex essentially gives us a, a linear approximation of my function and with that I mean the following suppose we have this uh, convex error function because my uh, cross entropy loss uh, was convex and I have an initial estimate for my uh, parameters w so this is w time step uh, 0 what my gradient descent algorithm does, it uh, looks for the gradient. So let's say it points in this direction. And then I'm going to walk downhill this gradient direction. So um, really what this gradient does, it gives us a local approximation of my function as a linear function. Uh, so it looks like this. I'm, the error, it basically says my error increases if I go in this direction and it decreases if I go in this direction. And of course we want to minimize the error so we move along the negative gradient direction. But we have to pick a step size, right? Because it keeps going down forever because it's a linear model. So um, <laughs> if I really want to minimize this linear approximation, I just go to infinity and I get my error which is minus infinity. Uh, which doesn't make sense of course. So I have to pick a certain step size. So that's what we do. And every time we estimate the gradient, pick a step size and then we walk downhill until we reached our uh, optimal value. Okay, so with stochastic gradient descent, so with stochastic gradient descent, I have to work with a particular step size uh, eta. Now what we're going to do in this uh, second order approximation scheme, I have my, so these blue lines correspond to my uh, true error function, and now I'm going to approximate locally, so I'm considering um, my function around the weight uh, set uh, w naught, and I'm going to make a quadratic approximation of my error function around this data point, and maybe it looks something uh, like this. So I make this quadratic approximation, so e uh, tilde is a function of w, and it, it maybe looks something like this. And what I'm then going to say, my next uh, model parameters are going to be given by the minimizer of this approximation. So it's a quadratic approximation, so it has one global uh, minimum, and it lies, for example, at this particular point. So that will be my next model parameters at time step at tau plus one. Okay, so I'm going to repeat this. I again obtain this quadratic approximation, and my approximation says that the global minimum of my approximation lies somewhere over here, so okay, that gives me the next point and so on. And by doing this, by making this quadratic approximation, I actually take a curvature of my energy error landscape into account. I sort of know from local inspection that I have to steer a bit in this direction and make my steps to, uh, step in this corresponding direction. And that in the end leads to the fact that not only I reach my uh, global optimum of my error landscape in less steps, it also shows uh, that I do not have to select a particular step size. Because in my linear approximation, I really do have to set a step size, otherwise I keep on going forever in one particular direction. Uh, but in the quadratic approximation case, uh, my approximation says there is one minimal value of my approximative uh, error landscape. Let's just pick that value. So there's no reason to set or select a particular step size. Okay, now in this video I'm going to explain how to obtain such a quadratic approximation uh, which essentially is done via Taylor expansion. Then I'll show how to minimize this uh, approximation and that gives me the next um, weight vector. And at some points, these points, they lie very close to each other because I've reached the global optimum. So basically I stop 
whenever my new iterate is very close to what I already had. Okay, so this gives me an algorithm for walking downhill this error landscape, uh, taking the curvature of my energy landscape into account, and in the end I will converge to my globally optimal uh, value for W. Okay, so what does all of this look like? I said I'm going to approximate my error function W with a second order Taylor expansion around the weights that I'm currently considering. So I'm computing a second order Taylor expansion around W at time step uh, tau minus one. Now what does such a Taylor expansion for multivariate functions looks like, uh, look like? So um, it's just a Taylor expansion as we've used to. So we take uh, the function value at the point that we're considering plus the first order derivative, which is now the gradient times a particular step size uh, relative to this uh, central point, plus my second order derivative, which is captured via this Hessian matrix times, well, my step size squared. And in the multivariate case, it means um, I multiply it on the left and right. So this Hessian is multiplied on the left and right of this uh, with this step size. Okay, so this is what the Taylor expansion uh, looks like. It's an approximation. It's a second order approximation of my error function W um, where I'm approximated in the following. So I center this approximation around my current uh, estimate for W and this is then a relative offset uh, parameter. And this Taylor expansion requires to compute first order derivatives, first order multivariate derivatives. So it requires us to compute the gradient, uh, which we've done already in the previous video but it also requires us to compute the second order derivatives which are captured in this Hessian. And this Hessian is a matrix with rows i and columns j given by my second order derivatives of my error wi wj. And this Hessian matrix is symmetric it is symmetric because I can change the order here. Uh, the derivatives uh, in this uh, vector space commute basically. So I am, I am allowed to change this order and that tells me that the Hessian is symmetric. For now, let's just focus on the recipe. So um, now I want to make my update rule uh, using a optimal step in the right direction. And I'm going to pick the step delta w that minimizes my approximated uh, error function. So that means, so that's, that's what I've explained over here, right? I made an estimate of my error functions. Those are those green contours. And I take as next data points, the w that minimize this, uh, this approximate error landscape. Okay, and now my approximation. So this e tilde is a quadratic function of this uh, step size delta w, right? So you have a linear component and a quadratic component. And so it means it has one globally optimal step size. And we will find this by taking uh, the derivative with respect to my step size and setting it to zero. That's what, we, what we've been doing so far in any of these optimization problems, right? So we take the derivative and set it to zero, solve it, and that will give us my optimal value. And now we're going to do the same for this uh, approximated uh, error function. So that means, okay, we're going to compute the derivative with respect to delta w. So the derivative with respect to delta w of this term, so not to w, uh, but to my step size. So this is the parameter in this approximation. Um, okay, so we compute the derivative uh, that will give me uh, the gradient itself. Then we take the derivative of this quadratic term. We see delta w over here. So this one drops out and we multiply this with a two. Uh, we've seen this actually uh, before that um, the derivative of such a quadratic function will be uh, two times a half times well, what we had transpose Hessian. And of course this uh, factor cancels out. So let me just remove it. Okay, so this is the derivative with respect to the step size delta w and we set it to zero. And this is the, my optimality criterion, right? So this is what we're going to solve now for my step size uh, delta w. Okay, let's solve this. So we move the gradient to the other side. 
and then take the transpose on both sides. So this is minus the gradient transpose. Right, I moved this to the other side and then took the transpose of both sides. And since the Hessian is symmetric, uh, this transpose doesn't do anything. And then we see that we have find uh, we find the optimal solution for the step size uh, to be minus Hessian inverse gradient. Okay, now let's do a dimensionality check or uh, let's see what, what we're dealing with here. So in our convention, the gradient is a row vector. Um, so taking the transpose turns this into a vector. So matrix vector multiplication gives me a new vector. So my new update step is again a vector. So that's correct because W is a vector. And now we take uh, a direction in this step. So we have our previous uh, weight uh, vector and we add now this step to it, which is given by minus Hessian inverse uh, times the gradient transpose of my uh, error. Okay, so let me quickly get back to this figure. So we were analyzing, uh, we're making an approximation of my error function around my initial uh, W, uh, that gives me this, for example, this quadratic form over here, which is given by this Taylor uh, expansion, this Taylor approximation. And then we solve basically um, for the minimal value of this error function that gives me the next, uh, that actually gives me a delta W relative to this uh, initial uh, W naught. So we jump in that direction and that gives me the next weight. So that's what you see over here. This is the update rule. Okay, so we see that, um, well, first of all, we do not need to define a step size because we immediately jump to the next um, optimal location uh, given our approximation. So, and what we need to compute then is the gradient. Well, we've done that so far. Um, I'll go over that in a minute. And we have to compute the Hessian. And that's also what I'm going to show next. As for the gradient, we showed that in the previous lecture for, um, if I say my error, if I say that my, uh, let me write it here. If my total error of W is given by the sum over all its components. So that's denoted with this EN. Okay, this is my error, and this is the gradient uh, vector. Uh, so we took the transpose here of my error, of my individual error for this data point. So that was just the error that I make for that data point times uh, the vector. So for the full uh, gradient, it looks like this. So the sum over all data points of yn minus tn phi n. So, and we can write this in matrix vector notation as followed, follows. So we have this um, design matrix containing all these uh, feature vectors times my prediction vector. So stacking all my predictions in one vector minus uh, the, target, oh, the target vector. Because recall that the data matrix or the design matrix is of size n by m. So for each data point, I had a feature vector and I stack them on top of each other. So I have all these rows of data points. And then if I take the transpose, that means I'm summing and multiplying over the nth, uh, over the n axis of the data the axis. So I'm multiplying all these errors with the corresponding uh, basis functions. And that will give me a vector of length m. Okay, so we compute the gradient in one step via this matrix vector multiplication. Now also the Hessian, we can write it in this matrix uh, vector form um, by computing, by writing out the i and j components of this matrix. Now we already computed uh, the gradient with respect to the j component, That's, that looks like this, this difference vector times the j component of, uh, well, the end data point, the end uh, feature vector. So this thing over here is essentially d, d, w, j of my error function. And now I'm computing the i derivative of this thing. And remember, we're computing derivative with respect to w, and the w is hidden in this uh, y n, right? Uh, because each y n, uh, let me write it over here, each y n is given by the logistic sigmoid of my w vector transpose. Phi n. 
Okay, so let's compute this, the derivative with respect to w of this thing. This thing doesn't depend on w, so I have to focus on the product of y n times phi j. So that gives me the sum n s1, the sum remains there, phi j of data point x n, and then the thing that actually depends on w, so the d y n d w i. Okay, so this thing is what I uh, have to compute. And it's also this thing of which we already computed the derivative um, previously. So let me write it above. The derivative of this thing is yn times 1 minus yn phi i xn. Okay, so let me insert that. That gives me the sum from n is 1 to n of yn 1 minus yn phi i phi j. Okay, so the i jade component of the Hessian is given by this expression. Now let's also write this in matrix factor notation. So that gives me, so let's start off with this. So this was my express, expression for the Hessian. So yn phi n phi n transpose. And I can write it like this because uh, the Hessian is an m by m matrix, where for each i and each j I have m components. So essentially I'm multiplying, uh, making this multiplication for every i, j. And I can do this uh, by taking uh, the, the product of my factor n with its trans transpose. So that's essentially this thing describes this for every i, j. Okay, so this gives me uh, the Hessian matrix. Let me see if I can also reduce this uh, sum over n. Um, so we can do that by working again with this design matrix, uh, transpose some diagonal matrix. Okay, so what is happening here? Each design matrix is again a dimension n by m. So this will be, with the transpose, this will give me a matrix of m by n. So I sum over the n axis also for this case, where since this is going to be now a diagonal matrix for which the Rn so the, the diagonal is given by yn1 minus yn, and the off-diagonal components are set to zero, so meaning if n unequals m. Okay, so now we also have an expression for uh, the Hessian uh, in this matrix uh, notation. Okay, so please verify yourself that this is indeed the case, right? That I can use these uh, design matrices with a diagonal matrix R, which essentially encodes these weights or these uh, components um, of N. Okay, so we have just derived the gradient and the Hessian uh, given the things that were provided to us, right? We have this data set, uh, which we uh, turn, uh, use the basis functions to create new feature vectors for each data point. So that's all encoded in this data matrix. And these are my predictions and these are my targets. And with that, I can compute the gradient and I can also compute the Hessian. Now that we have actually computed the Hessian, we can show that indeed the error function is convex. Um, where uh, we say that a function is convex whenever it's Hessian is positive definite. And positive definite basically means that if I multiply this Hessian on the left and right side with some non-zero w, then it always returns some positive value. So if we can show that this is the case, then we have proven that our Hessian is positive definite and indeed across entropy, a loss is convex. So let's uh, quickly do that. So we have computed our Hessian as follows, right? Using these design matrices, which were of size n by m, so we have n data points and m uh, feature vectors. And then we have this diagonal matrix, so a sort of weight matrix, which is of size n by n, which for each data point uh, assigns the following weight, so the product of these two uh, probabilities. Okay, so what, what I'm going to show next is that for every uh, w, transpose Hessian W, that this returns some positive value. So let me just write this out. So it's FW transpose times my design matrix transpose times R times phi times W. And what I'm going to do next is make use of the fact that each of these YNs, they're either bigger than uh, zero and uh, smaller than one. 
meaning that I can take the square root of these diagonal elements. So actually, I can, this allows me to write R as the product of these two uh, square roots, where I'm defining the square root of my matrix R as the diagonal matrix um, given by the square root of Yn times 1 minus Yn. Okay, I can do this, right? So this expression can be rewritten as W transpose my design matrix transpose square root of R square root of R phi W. And what we're actually essentially seeing here is we essentially take the scalar product between two, two vectors. So um, let me make that a little bit more explicit. So we're actually computing the product of this uh, vector. So this is a matrix. This is a matrix times a vector it gives me some new vector. And I take the transpose of this and I multiply it with itself. So that's essentially what is written over here. And the scalar product of a vector with itself uh, was down to taking the norm of this vector squared. So what we see is that we can rewrite uh, W transpose hash in W in the following form. And well, uh, a norm always gives me a positive value um, or it gives me zero when the vector is uh, zero, but we're considering all non-zero uh, Ws. So this proves that for every non-zero W, my expression uh, returns some positive number. So my Hessian is indeed convex, so it satisfies this uh, criterion for all non-zero vector Ws. That's what we've shown over here. So indeed, my Hessian is positive definite, and this means that my error function, my cross entropy loss, is indeed convex. Okay, and then we have everything in place to uh, compute this update rule, where we have to compute the gradient, which we can do as follows, where we have to compute the Hessian, or actually the inverse of the Hessian. Uh, so this is actually a, a, uh, actually a computationally expensive step, but we can do this. And for the Hessian, we make use of this sort of diagonal weight matrix, where we weight this inner product between all these um, factors using the weights yn, 1 minus yn. And this followed from, uh, well, um, the computation of the second order uh, derivatives. Okay, and now with this, this in place, we can actually rewrite this update step to a particular form, um, which actually led to the fact that people started calling this the iterative reweighted least squares algorithm. Um, because each update step can actually be formulated as a least squares problem, where uh, the new uh, weights are obtained via uh, some equivalent uh, fitting uh, least squares problem. And I'm going to show this at fol as follows. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rewrite this expression into a form uh, that corresponds to the solution to a, a weighted least squares problem. And I'm going to start off by factorizing this thing. So I move this thing up front. Um, okay, let me just write it out. Okay, you can see that this is still the same, right? So uh, this Hessian, uh, so this is actually the Hessian inverse. If I now multiply it with this, I end up with uh, W tau minus one. And if I multiply it with this thing, I obtain this uh, uh, form over here. So I'm just rewriting things now because especially in the next step, it will start to become clear what I'm doing. So let me also just write that one out. Now, what I did here, I introduced this new uh, var variable, uh, z or z, um, such that I could write it in this form. So it's a, it's a lot of trickery going on here, um, um, but I'm doing this because um, this term over here can then be canceled out because we have this r times r inverse, actually this phi times r times r inverse times this thing. So this entire thing then uh, can be get uh, rid of. And that would give me that this update rule is given in the following form. So this was the Hessian inverse as we saw it, R set. 
Okay, and this is what we wanted to see. We have that my new weights uh, at times at tau are given as follows. And just looking at um, this particular form, it resembles a lot the least squares solution, right? We've, we've seen this before, but then without the R. So if this R wouldn't be, be there, it would be just a least square solution to some fitting problem. But now we introduce these R's. So these R are, are, are additional weights. And we have this Z, uh, and that's sort of the thing that we want to predict. So what kind of regression problem would this correspond to? I'm going to write that out over here. So this would actually be the solution to the following minimization problem. So we're looking for the weights W that minimizes a weighted least squares where we have W transpose phi n minus Zn, where this would be uh, the target in my uh, fitting problem. Uh, and these are like uh, additional weights that sort of weights uh, the importance of, well, the data points that I'm considering. So not to be confused with, with my parameters uh, W, right? These are just weights used to weigh the error basically that you're making. Okay, now that's the reason why people call this the iterative uh, reweighted least squares algorithm, because in every update step, I'm essentially solving a weighted least squares problem uh, where my weights are given by uh, these weights, which were also used in the Hessian computation. Basically the product of my probability for class one times the product uh, times the probability for my uh, other class, you know, a uh, one minus uh, the probability for class one. And my targets are given as follows. And to be honest, I cannot give a clear interpretation to this, but the point is in each step, we solve this. Um, uh, weight at least squares problem where at each step we have to update the weights because these weights depend on W on my current solution W and I update my targets. Okay, so the main point of this slide was to show wh where does this iteratively re-rate at least squares uh, name come from. Um, so that this actually means that if we now draw this, so um, green here uh, shows the path obtained via stochastic gradient descent. So if we have curvature in our energy landscape, we sort of take a roundabout route because we just walk downhill uh, without considering like the overall landscape. Whereas in my second order um, optimization scheme, so the newton refson scheme, I actually take the curvature of my error landscape into account and that allows me to come up with a shorter uh, route. And the idea behind this newton refson optimization was um, that we uh, make an approximation of our error function, like a quadratic approximation, solve it for its optimal location and jump to that point. Then again, we make this quadratic uh, approximation and immediately jump to that point where we start off with an, an initial uh, set of weights and the weights at the next time step where in each step, the new model parameters are obtained via this uh, weighted least squares uh, problem, where at each <laughs> time step you solve uh, this um, weighted least squares problem with targets that are updated based on the current set of parameters. And also my weights for this uh, weighted least squares are updated based on my uh, current predictions. Okay, now there's some clear advantages of newton refson over a stochastic gradient uh, descent. Uh, first of all, we have that there's no need uh, to define a step size. So that's nice. It doesn't depend on, well, this additional hyperparameter, the step size. Um, it also converges faster. Um, so faster convergence than stochastic gradient descent, but it requires uh, the Hessian. But most importantly, we need to compute the inverse of the Hessian. And this is computationally the most expensive step of this uh, update scheme, computing the inverse of the Hessian, because computing the inverse of a matrix often uh, scales uh, cubically with the number of elements in the Hessian, uh, with the number of basis functions that it considers. So it scales with m to the power three. 
And there's a lot of research going on on uh, figuring out which kind of matrices can be inverted quickly and also how to make maybe clever approximations to this. Uh, because it is nice that you can obtain your final globally optimal uh, solution with less steps. It's just that these steps are hard to compute and there are smart uh, approximations and alternatives to, to this actually. Okay, so what I described was an alternative for stochastic gradient descent, a second order optimization method. And at this point, I just want to uh, point out that such second order optimization methods do not just apply to uh, the logistic regression case, but uh, it could be applied to, to other type of optimization problems as well. In the next couple of videos, I'll be talking about artificial neural networks also known under the name multi-layer perceptrons. We'll start off by interpreting neural networks as functions that compute feature vectors, uh, which are subsequently used for classification or for regression. Now recall that so far we have computed feature vectors from our inputs via fixed basis functions. In the next videos, I'll show that we can actually learn such basis functions via neural networks. Now in this video, I'll first explain what neural networks are and how they relate to these basis functions. And then in the next video, we'll go over some examples in the, const, uh, in the context of function approximation. Now let's start by recalling how we were uh, dealing with basis functions uh, so far. So the setting was uh, always we are provided with some data set and targets and then we want to solve some problem with it. And um, our data points were always considered uh, to be vectors in some d-dimensional uh, vector space. And then what we often did was uh, we first computed uh, feature vex vectors given my input. So my inputs were transformed to a new space uses, using basis functions. And we can use the basis functions such that eventually a regression or classification problem becomes easier. And so far we really um, picked these basis functions ourselves just by inspecting the data we thought that maybe Gaussian Bayesian functions or maybe polynomials of a certain order uh, would be useful to, to solve a problem with. Um, okay, another thing is we typically use uh, set the, the, the zero basis function to one because that in allows us to incorporate um, the bias in our models uh, by just uh, considering functions of the form so linear functions in the regression case, for example, just taking the scalar product of my basis functions or my basis feature vectors with a set of weights. So then I obtain a linear model, a linear function of W, but it's a nonlinear mapping because I first pull this X uh, through my uh, basis functions. Okay, and then for linear regression, um, we uh, were working with targets that could take on any uh, value on the real line. So it was a continuous fitting uh, problem. Uh, so we do not work with any activation function. We just work with this linear model. Now in the classification setting, our targets uh, took on binary values. So they could either be zero or one. Uh, so we had to work with a, a, a nonlinear activation function that basically ensures that we have this uh, property. And then we come up, can come up with uh, proper um, classification frameworks and optimization schemes. Um, for, for example, for binary targets, uh, an optimal approach uh, was proven to be logistic regression, in which case we still have this linear component over here. So that actually leads to linear decision boundaries in the end. Uh, but we have this nonlinear function over here. So this nonlinear activation function. So for classification, we considered so far generalized linear models, so a linear component, linear in W. Uh, but overall nonlinear because we have this uh, uh, activation function. Okay, so that's what we've seen so far. And I also said that uh, maybe we also want to learn the basis functions ourselves because now we're hand designing them. We made choices there and uh, for low dimensional cases, we could still do it, but for higher dimensional cases, it's very hard to come up with a proper choice for basis functions. So ideally we want to make this part of the learning uh, procedure and that's uh, precisely uh, what we're going to do uh, when we optimize neural networks. Okay, now let me remind us again that uh, for convenience, we will work with uh, feature vectors which have like a constant one as the first component and then uh, the original data points, the original vector. So we prepend our data vectors with a one such that we can include the bias uh, 
the bias parameter inside uh, the set of weights that we're going to consider. Okay, and now we take on the viewpoint on neural networks as uh, functions that work with adaptive basis functions to compute the feature vectors. Uh, so these feature vectors are then later used for uh, regression or for classification. Uh, but the learning of this basis function uh, will be part of the learning process itself. And these particular basis functions will be parameterized via generalized linear models. And this means that each uh, basis function takes on the following form, right? So the basis function is a function of x and it is parameterized by its own set of uh, parameters w. And, it's, and so this basis function is defined in the following way. So it says linear mapping um, followed by some nonlinear activation function. So this part is just a linear model and this part is a nonlinear function mapping, nonlinear, uh, what we call an activation function. So to make this a little bit more explicit, our uh, linear part really consists of taking a linear combination of my input values uh, weighted with the corresponding uh, well, weight values. And these Ws, those are parameters that now become part of, of the learning procedure. And once we've linearly transformed our inputs, uh, we pull it through this uh, activation function. So we see that each basis function um, is now defined by some generalized linear model. Okay, and now we have defined our basis functions, which are parameterized uh, by a set of uh, weights w, which we all are now also going to learn. Okay, but now we have these basis functions and we want to solve problems with it. And we're doing this just like we've been doing uh, so far. So for the regression case, we just work with a linear model. So a linear model uh, applied to uh, my feature vectors. And these are my now computed feature vectors. And I'm going to take linear combinations of this to make a prediction for y. So let me write this out. So this looks like my linear model and the scalar product with my new feature vector. Um, my new feature vector, I can write it in this way, W1 transpose X. And you see, I'm now indexing uh, the set of weights, right? Because this uh, set of parameters is associated with my first step of transformation. So uh, used in my basis functions. And then the second set of, of weights is used in my output layer that these contribute to my final output prediction. And what I did over here, I defined this matrix. So this a big W1 to be, um, well, the collection of all my basis function um, vectors, right? So if I put them all next to each other, so let me do that. So each uh, basis function had its own set of uh, uh, linear parameters w and if I put them next to each other then I can obtain the predictions or the feature values for each m uh, in one go via this matrix vector multiplication where each time I multiply uh, the weights of basis function 1 with my input and then of 2 with my input and that gives me this column vector this column vector of uh, new feature values which are then pulled through this activation function. So this thing over here is what we've been um, used to seeing like this. So a vector of uh, feature values obtained uh, from some basis function, but now the basis function is learned. And then we obtain our regression model as a linear model. So uh, this scalar product of my model parameters W with this learned uh, basis function. So really a regression uh, problem can be formulated as a, as a two layer neural network in that sense. So we have first layer that computes the feature vectors and then we have a final layer that uh, contributes to my uh, prediction. Now, similarly, we can uh, use these learned basis functions um, to, to solve classification problems. And in that uh, setting, we work with generalized linear models, uh, but now it's a generalized linear model um, using my learned uh, feature vectors. So my feature vectors were obtained via this uh, weight matrix uh, one with my feature vector x. Where again, in this matrix vector multiplication, I multiply the set, the set of weights for each basis function with the input, the next basis function uh, for this input, and then pull it through this activation function. So again, this thing over here gives me my learned uh, feature vector. And then in a classification setting, we use this activation function 
we use the logistic sigmoid or in the multi-class uh, classification case, we worked with a softmax function to turn uh, these values into probabilities. Okay, so what I just uh, showed essentially defines two layer neural networks. And in the upcoming slides, I'll, I'll show some examples of deeper uh, neural networks. Uh, but these are just uh, two layer neural networks and we gave them the interpretation of uh, basically working with learned basis uh, vectors, basis functions. Okay, so that defines a two layer neural network and in, as a model, as a mathematical, mathematical model is given as follows. Uh, but we are also going to get used to these network diagrams. This is what you typically see when people explain how they design the neural networks to, to others. They work with these kind of visualizations because those are often more uh, easier, easier to interpret than these equations. And I'll show some example later on where this definitely is the case. So let's go over the components of multi-layer perceptrons of neural networks. So first of all, we have the input units. Um, so we have an input vector X, um, which is prepended with a one. So we have X1 up to XD. And each of these components is called an input unit. So each such value is represented with one of such uh, dots over here. So I have a D dimensional a d plus one dimensional input because I prepended a one and then each input unit is represented as one dot. So this dot, you should really think of it as taking on just one real number, right? It's, it's one of these components within my vector. Then we have what we call activations denoted with a and they're also indexed uh, with some index m in this case. So this a is a vector of activation, so A1 up to AM. And this uh, vector is obtained via this matrix vector multiplication, right? My first uh, model parameter is W uh, times X. And this gives me an M dimensional feature vector, though it's not yet the final feature vector because this is just a linear part. And we first have to pull it through this a nonlinear activation function to, to turn this into uh, what we refer to as the basis uh, function feature vectors uh, so far. Okay, but before we get there, um, we do this linear mapping and this leads to what we call the activations. So let's draw that over here in yellow. Then we have what we call hidden units denoted with Z and also with the same index M because these ZMs, those are the feature vectors obtained from the activations by really activating them with the corresponding activation function. Okay, so we have all these hidden units, set M, and they're obtained by applying this activation function. So by applying the activation function H to A, and that gives me the corresponding uh, hidden unit. And these hidden units will in turn be used as inputs for the next layer, right? So these hidden units are the feature vectors at that point used to well, obtain my new feature values uh, using this linear uh, uh, combination of the hidden units. But we're considering here uh, the two layer uh, neural network. So my next layer would be then uh, my output layer and the units or the values at the output are called the output units. And these output units are typically denoted with Y with a particular index K. So this is the K output unit. And these output units, as said before, form this vector of outputs, a y1 to yk. And these are obtained with my second uh, linear mapping, with my second set of weights from uh, my hidden units. And this would then give me my k dimensional uh, output vector. Okay, so each value in this output vector correspond to one of such nodes and it's called an output unit. So this would be my k output value. It's just a number, it's just a real number. So this is just a reminder at each node we should think that it replace some real value, right? And we call each of these values, we call them well units. So we have an input unit x, uh, we have a hidden unit set m and we have an output unit uh, yk. And then finally, we work with these uh, activation units. So each layer has its own activation unit. 
uh, but typically we just say we use one unit to help my network, except maybe for the output where we may maybe make specific choices uh, that depend on the problem, right? In linear regression, maybe you do not want to have any output uh, activation, uh, but for logistic regression or for classification, you maybe want to apply a logistic sigmoid or a soft max to the output layer. Uh, but generally we say uh, we stick with one choice for um, activation function that turns my activations into the hidden units. Okay, so these are all the components of a multi-layer perceptron of a two-layer neural network in this particular case. Uh, now it's only two layers. So we start off with uh, an input unit. So that's all those uh, input values, XD. Those are transformed linearly via my weights at, in the first layer to give me the activations, to give me the activations of the first layer. And these activations are in turn, in turn turned into um, hidden units, the set amps by applying this activation function H to my uh, activations. And then those uh, hidden units uh, are used as inputs for the next linear model. So that's why we apply this W now here, that gives me all these uh, output units. And then we can decide to apply uh, another activation units to my, uh, an activation to my outputs. So we have inputs X, we have this matrix factor multiplication with my first set of, of weights, uh, W1, that gives me in the end the activations, and then it gives me the, the hidden unit, so this hidden unit factor uh, Z, which is then transformed via linear uh, transformation with my set of parameters uh, W2, and that gives me my output activations. Okay, so uh, that explains all the components. Now let's just take a quick look at choices that we have for the activation functions. Um, what is listed here are some popular choices for activation functions. Um, the logistic sigmoid, that's classically uh, one that is used a lot in neural networks. Um, we, for now, used it uh, only for the, the output layers uh, to turn a problem into a logistic regression problem or a classification problem. We worked we, we already saw this uh, logistic uh, sigmoid before. So this is the logistic sigmoid. And it's drawn over here as this green line, right? So it, it squashes all the values um, of my linear model to the range uh, 0, 1. And that allows us to interpret things as uh, probabilities, uh, essentially. Then what we see in red is the hyperbolic tangent. So the hyperbolic tangent, which is given by e to the power x minus e to the power minus x divided by e to the power x plus e to the power minus x. Okay, that's indicated here in red. Um, it also has this nice uh, squashing property, but now it, it squashes all the, uh, the values between the values minus 1 and plus 1, and it has this sort of linear uh, part over here. So close to, to 0, this function is, is linear. Uh, but if my uh, activations take on very high values, uh, then those get uh, truncated at the value 1, essentially. So those two are classically quite popular choices, uh, but it turned out that if you go uh, deeper into your networks, then uh, these activation functions aren't actually uh, so nice to work with. And this has to do that with the fact that uh, when we optimize these models, we have to compute the gradients. That is what we have seen also in the other models. We apply gradient descent uh, type of methods and apply chain rules. And now if you pull things to such uh, activation functions, then you also need the derivative of these kind of things. And you see that both the logistic sigmoid and the hyperbolic tangent, they sort of flatten off uh, to some constant value. That also means that the derivatives at these locations will take on very small uh, values. And this leads to numerical instability in the end. And when we optimize neural networks with, uh, with such activation functions. And the type of activation function that doesn't suffer from this is the rectified linear uh, unit or ReLU. And that is given by the max of zero with A. So this function really is a linear model of A, so it has this linear part and everything below zero is just mapped to the value zero. So it's, it's just like a threshold uh, function. So this rectified linear unit, the ReLU, is by far uh, the most popular activation uh, function at the moment uh, uh, out there.
And then I have a small but very important remark about working with activation functions. Um, because you could, maybe you're tempted to think, okay, why do we need activation functions? Things become much more simpler if we don't apply them. And the main reason actually is that it doesn't make sense if you build deep neural networks or neural networks without activation functions. Because if you do not apply an activation here, then I just concatenate linear operations one after each other. And a concatenation of linear operators in the end result in one netto uh, linear operator. So then you assign all these weights and in the end uh, you could have done this directly with one uh, linear model. Um, so in order to make things uh, complex and interesting, we do need activation functions. Otherwise we just end up with some linear model. Okay, so let me just write that down over here such that we don't forget it. We need activation Okay, so don't forget about this. We do need activation functions, otherwise we're just learning uh, linear models. And then we don't need all this uh, complicated uh, structure over here. Now let's uh, familiarize ourselves a bit uh, further with neural networks by considering types of neural networks that we actually already saw throughout this course. First of all, we already worked uh, with one layer neural networks. So these are just linear models, uh, right, or, or maybe generalized linear models, and we work with them in the linear regression case. So really what we did in the linear regression case, we said, okay, we want to predict our outputs or maybe the target means of my target distributions um, with a parameterization uh, factor W, just via this linear mapping from input to output Y. So that's essentially what you see over here. All the input units are multiplied with the corresponding weights and that gives me my output y. And in the regression case, we wanted to regress any value on the real line, uh, so we do not apply any activation function, or in this case, the activation function is just the identity operator. Okay, so we already encountered uh, one layer neural networks. Uh, we also encountered them in the uh, classification case, where we were building classification models for each class uh, k. We wanted to predict some probability and this probability was given by such a generalized linear model. So again, a linear uh, combination of the input. So each k output, each k class had its own set of weights, a w. And when dealing with k classes, we applied the softmax, the softmax uh, activation functions uh, to these activations, such that these outputs could be interpreted as the probability for class K given my input X. So that looks like this, right? So each output uh, prediction YK was obtained by a linear combination of my inputs. And then uh, we applied a soft max activation function uh, due to all these uh, output uh, predictions. So that describes a linear classification model uh, with K classes as a one layer neural network. So those are just one layer uh, neural networks. That's not super interesting, right? It's just regression or just uh, uh, classification via generalized linear models. So things become interesting when we go deeper. And what this essentially means is that we have all these uh, mappings, so a linear transformation followed via a nonlinear activation uh, function that gives me a new feature vector. Again, linear combination, activation function. So we apply all these mappings and you could think of it at, as in the end, ending up with a very complex uh, basis function as a function of x, right? This value is obtained via all these mappings, so it's a function of x in the end, where this basis function is then essentially parameterized by all the weights uh, before this. And then once we have obtained such a feature vector, uh, then these values can be used to make our final predictions to solve the problem that we were actually dealing with. And so this could be a multi a uh, multi-target regression problem, or it could be a multi-class classification problem, or whatever the problem is that, that you're working on, right? So we can build very deep neural networks, where deep means really uh, how many uh, layers you have. So a deeper, networks, a, a deeper network has a lot of layers. So we can essentially now build very deep networks to come up with very uh, intricate, very complicated uh, feature vectors at this point. And this also exposes why we really like to work with such a diagram, because if I write this out uh, as an equation, it looks something like this. So this equation corresponds to my diagram, where we have these 
uh, inputs X, so those are my input units. Those are transformed via the weights in my first layer um, to the activations. So the activations of the first layer and those activations are in turn transformed via uh, the activation functions into the corresponding hidden units. So each node, each value over here is called a hidden unit. Then uh, let me use a different color. Then uh, the next layer gives me the values of the next uh, hidden unit. And these hidden units are again used as input for the next layer. So a linear transformation followed by this activation gives me uh, the, the activations and the hidden uh, units at layer three, which is then again linearly transformed followed by a final activation. And this gives me my uh, outputs uh, Y. So this is my neural network written out and it's nothing else as a, a stacking of linear layers, linear transformations followed by a pointwise nonlinear um, activation. And I'm just putting this out here as a reference. Uh, sometimes it's more convenient to work with this notation where this uh, O dot or this circle uh, denotes uh, function concatenation. So I'm concatenating a linear transformation with a nonlinear one followed by a linear via a nonlinear one. So this a circle means function concatenation. Um, yeah, okay, it's just for convenience sometimes uh, we write this, sometimes we write this, but quite often in this course, uh, we just show uh, the diagram and then uh, focus on specific parts of uh, my neural networks and write those out. Okay, and then it becomes easier to actually design such neural networks to be, become creative in how we uh, actually transform my inputs in the end to a particular uh, feature vector that, that is used for classification or regression. So we can allow for skip connections, for example. And these skip connections follow the same principle. So it means that each input unit can contribute to another uh, activation by just taking linear combinations of these uh, hidden or input units and they can skip a layer, which means in this case that the, the activation of the units in this layer is formed by taking linear combinations of my uh, hidden units at the previous layer plus taking linear combinations of my inputs. And we could decide to give such a layer, such sets of weights, its own index uh, for I think we would still refer to this as a three layer neural networks because it has this, uh, as a function of depth, it has these three uh, trainable layers. Um, and this is what we call a skip connection. So this is what we refer to as a three layer neural network with skip connections. And sometimes we make these choices of skip connections because it is theoretically motivated. Um, and sometimes uh, we, we just do this uh, because we empirically found that it is useful to do uh, such a thing. Either way, we are allowed to be creative with how we design our neural networks. This also means that we can decide not to connect every node, every uh, unit with, uh, the, the, with all the units in the next layer. Uh, for example, here we omitted, we omitted, for example, this connection and this connection. So these connections are omitted. And this leads to what we call sparse neural networks. So sparse neural networks. And also this, this is a choice that we can make. And sometimes we make this choice because it's convenient because we don't have too much processing power and we want to sort of reduce the computational load. So we sort of uh, remove some connections uh, leading to a sparse neural network. Um, but sometimes we also want to impose a particular structure um, and we can do that by, well, selecting which uh, nodes connect to the other nodes. And this is particularly so the case when we talk about convolutional neural networks, um, which have additional weight sharing. So uh, apart from deciding where to place connections, we can also decide to assign the same weights to a particular set of connections. So in this example, for example, the, the blue uh, connections all have a weight one, the green connection all have a weight two, and the orange connections all have a weight three. So this is what we call weight sharing, that there are multiple connections, multiple uh, weights that essentially have share the same weight. So this means that we can define convolutions also via neural networks, where we recognize maybe this convolutional structure here by moving this pattern of weights to the next node. So we see that at every feature vector, 
is obtained by a linear combination of a local uh, neighborhood and this local neighborhood shifts. Now this convolutional structure is best explained with, uh, with an extra uh, visualization. Um, let's first of all start out by denoting such a linear mapping from input to the next activations uh, via matrix vector multiplication, right? So we have, uh, let, let this be or, uh, the, the vector of all my uh, input uh, units and let this be the vector of activations. Then each activation, for example, activation A1 is obtained by multiplying all these weights, so all the connections to A, A1 uh, with, um, well, the input vector. So we have this uh, row vector uh, multiplication. And then in the next activation is obtained also uh, by this uh, row vector multiplication. So this entire stack of activation can be obtained by this big matrix. So if all these weights that fully parameterize uh, basically all possible uh, linear maps from input to the next uh, uh, layer. And we're now going to turn this into a convolutional form. So um, convolutions are applied to structured data on functions on some axis. So now, for example, we consider a 1D signal. So it assigns for every time point on this axis. So let's just index it. So with a 1 to D. So I split this signal into D values. So each point on the signal represents one value x1. So let that be your input uh, unit, input vector. Now what a convolution does, uh, you apply this convolution kernel at every location. So we take a linear combination of my neighborhood values and that gives me the new value um, for my output vector, for my output signal. So let me write this out. So when we consider my output vector A to be obtained by this convolution or correlation actually uh, with a correlation kernel W, then the jade component of this output vector is obtained via sum over some neighborhood. Let's denote it with Y minus J. So uh, this distance smaller than K. So K is some kernel size. This is a smaller than. Okay, the sum of the values within this neighborhood uh, with a, a set of weights that are aligned with my data point I. So this is my shifted uh, convolution kernel uh, W. So this correlation or convolution looks like this. So I move my set of weights, my kernel around, and every time I take this inner product, I, pro I multiply this weights with my signal over there. So I have three weights over here, and that gives me the signal at this point. Okay, so that's what's happening. In order to obtain the, the value for my output at this location, I multiply this kernel, these weights, with uh, the underlying input X for this uh, small neighborhood. Okay, so that's what you see over here, right? My first uh, output value, so somewhere over here, is obtained by multiplying these weights with the first couple of uh, input data points. Then I move to the next data point, uh, and then I shift my weights accordingly. And basically it means I multiply the rest with zeros. But then my output A2 is obtained via W1, W2, W3 times X2, X3, X4. So I shift my kernel uh, all the time and that's what you see in this uh, matrix. Okay, so what you see is that this uh, convolution operator uh, is essentially a matrix vector multiplication with an incredibly sparse matrix. So there's a lot of zeros, so that also means there's a lot of multiplication and computations that I do not need to perform. And then on top of that, we have weight sharing. So these weights are shared uh, over this diagonal uh, band, which corresponds to a shift um, uh, of, of, of my kernel. Okay, so this leads to an incredible reduction of uh, parameters that we need to train, uh, but maybe more importantly, it preserves the structure of my signal. If my input, uh, if my input represents some signal, then I want to preserve maybe this structure because I, well, uh, then I can apply this, this weight sharing. So convolutional neural networks are a specialized type of neural networks that are super efficient uh, with the parameters. And that also uh, contributes highly to the success of convolutional neural networks. Most applications nowadays are built on top of these uh, convolutional neural networks. So when we have such structured data structures, we do not want to uh, fully parameterize uh, my neural network, but only work with maybe a sparse set of connections plus weight sharing. Okay, enough about uh, convolutional neural networks. So 
in general, we have these feed forward architectures and we can be very creative in how we design this. Sometimes we want to design it because we want to preserve data structure, meaning that maybe we want to sparsify uh, our network and uh, uh, apply weight sharing. So we can decide not to connect every node to every other data point. We can also dis decide to put the same weights along several edges. And we also may uh, decide to put uh, skip connections in our network. Okay, so anything is possible really as, as long as uh, you form these, uh, these units, these hidden units at some layer, uh, exclusively by taking linear combinations of uh, units of lower layers. So really we want to preserve this feed forward uh, mechanism because once we start including uh, closed cycles, then we have uh, some dynamics that can become very unstable. And um, so generally that's not what you want and it becomes actually computationally impossible to, to work with this. So these ZJs can be any hidden unit from one of the lower from one of the lower layers. So that wraps it up for uh, neural networks. So now we know what they look like, uh, what they are actually, and how to construct them. Um, so in the next videos, we're going to explore what we can actually do with neural networks. One of the main reasons for the popularity of artificial neural networks is the flexibility of the approach. It turns out that neural networks can represent basically any function that you want to approximate to any precision, of course given enough model parameters. Now this is a fact given by the universal approximation theorem. And essentially it says that we can use neural networks for all sorts of problems where we want to recover complex function mappings from input to output. And so far we, for example, have been very much interested in finding such ma mappings from input to output in the context of regression and classification. Now this slide shows the universal approximation theorem. And um, we're not going to use this video to, to, prove, to prove this theorem. We're just going to use it to gain some understanding and see what this theorem actually implies. So let's start off by, by reading what it says. So first of all, we're dealing uh, with function f. So that can be any continuous function on a compact area RD. And this will be the function that we're going to approximate with a neural network. Now such neural networks are based on uh, these linear layers and activation functions. And let now this h be the activation function. So the activation function of my neural network uh, which can be anything, but it cannot be polynomial. So that's the only uh, criteria that we have. So what we then consider, we consider a two-layer neural network, as we've seen in the, in the previous uh, lecture. And we're going to use this neural network to approximate this function uh, that we started off with, right? And we're going to approximate it to some precision uh, epsilon, so some small positive number, such that for every point x, uh, these functions are very close to each other, um, where closeness is given by uh, this uh, small number epsilon. Then this theorem says that there exist uh, two layer neural networks that can become arbitrary close to my uh, function uh, f that I want to approximate, where closeness is controlled via this epsilon parameter. And this means that the, the, the smaller or the higher my precision, the more number of hidden uh, units I need. But it is possible to find such a number of, of hidden units that allows me to construct such a model that comes arbitrary close to my uh, function. Switching back to this basis function viewpoint, my two layer neural networks uh, learn these basis functions uh, phi m of my input uh, x. And so basically these construct uh, complex feature vectors, which in turn are used in this linear model and that, that is given by my two-layer uh, neural network. And this two-layer neural network can then be arbitrary close to the function that I want to approximate. Now, I want to gain some intuition of what this uh, theorem essentially tells us. And I'm going to do that by starting off with, with ReLU-based um, neural networks. So basically, this theorem says I can choose any activation function I like, as long as it isn't polynomial. Now, uh, the ReLU, so the ReLU was this... Um, max of zero and a. Uh, so with the ReLU, I can also come arbitrary close uh, to any function that I want to approximate. And I'm go going to show this as follows. 
First of all, recall that this uh, first layer can be interpreted as generating these basis functions, right? I have m of such basis functions after the first layer, and these basis functions are defined via m of such linear mappings that are then uh, pulled to such a ReLU activation function. And this ReLU makes sure that all these values uh, become positive. Okay, so I have m sets of weights. Now let's take a look at, at the 1D case. So let's suppose my input is one dimensional. Then what my first uh, set of linear weights does, it assigns some, some, some slope. So it creates these linear functions uh, by multiplying x with the weight of my first basis function uh, in the first layer plus some bias, okay? So that generates this, this linear function uh, and then I apply a ReLU to it. So I'm only going to take uh, the positive part of this. So that means that everything below zero is mapped to zero actually. And that actually gives me then my first basis function. So this would be phi one of X. Okay, now let's uh, consider a, a different M. So basically uh, the, the next activation in my first layer. So suppose maybe this one has a negative slope. So it would generate this linear function uh, given by uh, w2, so that was my uh, second uh, activation of the first layer times x, so that's this slope, plus some uh, bias. Okay, and also this one is then activated with the ReLU, which truncates everything at zero. So if I take the ReLU of this thing, um, well, we got this uh, positive basis function. So this would give me phi2 of x. Okay, now let's consider also a third basis function, which maybe has a slope and the bias, which creates this uh, linear function over here, which is also truncated at zero via this uh, uh, ReLU activation function. So that will give me the third basis function. Okay, so what I just drew were, were, was this first layer, right? So this these linear components, I had M is a tree. I had three of such uh, basis functions in the end that for every X provide a particular activation. Then what happens in the next layer is I'm going to take linear combinations again of these activations. So essentially linear combinations of these basis functions. So that, uh, that allows me to give a response for every possible X. Uh, so let me draw that what's happening here. So that means also my final output is going to be a function of X and it will be given by uh, the weighted sum. So really this linear combination. So I assign a weight in my second layer to each of these basis functions. So that's what my output is going to look like. Okay, now let's move from, from left to right. So um, on the left, we only have really one basis function that is active and let's just give it a, like a positive weight, uh, weight one. So I really replicate this uh, basis function over here. Then my function remains a zero for a while. For a while. And then this particular basis function kicks in. Let's also give it a positive weight. So, well, the function uh, starts increasing. Then this uh, particular basis function kicks in and let's assign it a negative weight. So if I add this slope, well, make it negative. Let's subtract this slope to this one. Uh, then maybe the function starts to look something like this. So essentially what is happening here that with such uh, ReLU based activation functions, I create basis functions that uh, look something like this, that are only activated for particular values of X and are uh, zero otherwise. And then if I start to make linear combinations of these basis functions, then I get the result that my uh, resulting functions, they will become piecewise linear where we transition from one linear piece to the other. So here I have a linear piece, here it's a constant zero, here I have a linear piece, and here the transitioning between these uh, points take place at the locations where my basis functions uh, become active. Okay, so that's the core idea behind uh, neural networks with values that I'm able to construct functions that are piecewise linear. And then the universal approximation theorem says that I can use these piecewise uh, linear functions, so these two layer uh, neural networks to approximate any uh, function to arbitrary precision. So let this be the function that we want to approximate. And let this, for example, the, be the epsilon interval, uh, which we need to stay within. So that defines the regions that I'm allowed uh, to pass through with my function.
then if I'm going to approximate this with a piecewise linear function, I could do something like this, like a segment over here, over here, over here. So in that sense, I can approximate this function with only three uh, basis functions. Now, if I'm going to reduce the interval, um, so I make epsilon smaller, then I have to stay close to my data, or I have to stay close to my uh, signal that I want to approximate. Uh, okay, then again, still can basically work with more of these uh, piecewise linear functions. And in this particular case, I need, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, basis functions. So with M is nine, I can now approximate my signal uh, to a closer precision, so uh, for a smaller uh, epsilon. Okay, so this is a sort of visual proof that I can approximate any uh, continuous uh, signal uh, with just these piecewise linear uh, ReLU networks up to some arbitrary precision. And if I want to approximate this closer and closer, I basically need more and more of these uh, uh, basis functions. And with more basis functions, I need more and more hidden units, uh, which this, this M represented the number of hidden units in my uh, two layer uh, neural network. Okay, uh, then it follows by induction that uh, deeper neural networks also have this property. And then we can talk about um, what is the most efficient way of starting approximating or constructing these complex functions. And let's consider the following. Let's, let's say we have a neural network with L layers. So this is a deep neural network. Uh, then we can appro approximate this uh, deep neural network with a shallow neural network. Uh, let's say with only L, L prime layers because that's what our universal approximation theorem uh, says, right? I can approximate any function, so also this deep neural network uh, with a shallow uh, neural network with only L prime uh, layers, right? And I can approximate this deep neural network then with a shallow neural network up to some arbitrary precision parameter epsilon. Then it turns out uh, that the number of hidden units that I need to approximate this deeper neural network scales exponentially with decreasing epsilon. So with, if I want to be more precise, I need an exponential growth in the number of hidden units. And this in turn implies that uh, approximation with deep neural networks is more uh, parameter efficient. Now maybe that, let's take a second thought on that uh, in the context of these uh, ReLU networks. So. In ReLU networks, we saw that the expressive power of such a, a ReLU-based deep neural networks is associated with the number of linear regions, right? So because we have a ReLU network leads to these piecewise linear uh, neural networks. And well, the more pieces I have, the more accurate uh, my predictions or my uh, approximations become. And the number of regions that I can represent with uh, ReLU-based deep neural networks uh, scales uh, with the width, so it scales polynomial in width, but it scales exponentially with depth. And in this case, this D is uh, the input uh, dimension. So the most efficient way of, of gaining more region is not to, to widen my networks or to add more hidden units per layer, but simply to go deeper and consider more layers, right? Because then let's say I have a fixed number of parameters that I can spend. Uh, and I can distribute them over my network, design different networks, so I can make choices. And the number of parameters as a function of width uh, scales quadratically, because um, in these neural networks, I want to connect every input to the output of the, well, the next layer. So that's, uh, let's say, width times width, number of parameters I need there. And then for each layer, uh, I, I need this uh, quadratic number of, of, uh, of parameters. So my total number of parameters is given by width squared times depth. So when I'm then told, okay, this is the number of parameters that you can spend. Now make your uh, choices based on the width, width and the depth of the networks. Uh, then, um, well, it's clearly that most expressive power is gained by going deeper uh, with maybe less neurons per layer. So with less uh, hidden units per layer. Um, then staying shallow with more neurons per layer. And then this also explains the popularity of deep neural networks versus shallow neural networks, simply because these deeper neural networks were able to, to perform more complex tasks. And this was sort of empirically discovered, but it was also theoretically proven via such uh, statements. So building deeper neural networks is uh, better in terms of expressive power and the, the, the type of problems that you can solve than uh, staying shallow. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of such uh, function approximations. 
Um, maybe first of all, um, what kind of problem does this correspond to? Are we now talking about classification or are we talking about regression? We're talking about regression, right? Because our objective is to map any input to a corresponding output uh, value. So these input output pairs are now given via my ground root function f of x. So in this particular case, f of x is x squared. And we sample 50 points of this. So these are these blue dots. So those form my input output pairs, which we're going to reconstruct with a neural network. And our neural network is a two layer neural network with only three hidden units and a 10 tangent hyperbolic activation function and only one linear output, right? Because I want to predict this particular uh, value. So my neural network really looks something like this. So I have my input X and uh, then we have this hidden unit. So I have only three hidden units. So this would be set one and I apply a 10 H on these uh, activations on these hidden units. And these are then combined via my uh, output uh, weights so w to to my prediction. Okay, and recall that these hidden units, like just before the output layer, take on the interpretation as my feature vector, right? So these hidden units, as a function of x, for my basis functions, for my basis functions that I can use to obtain my final prediction. And you see with only three of such basis functions, we can take linear combinations of these to, to form this uh, parabolic uh, shape over here. So we actually have a perfect reconstruction. Now figure B is then, uh, we're trying to approximate a sine of X. And also here we see, nice, so that's really nice, this idea that, that we're learning these basis functions. And with these three type of basis functions, I can assign weights to this basis function and that would give me the sign uh, reconstruction. Now these are nice smooth continuous functions but we can also approximate for example uh, the absolute value of x and then we have this a sharp transition going on over here so overall we have a good approximation but we see that the approximation wiggles a bit and here it takes a shortcut so um, of course we made some we make some errors and this basically implies that we need more hidden units to also represent these sharp uh, details. And then in figure D, we try to approximate the, the heavy side step function uh, hx. So it really takes on the value zero below this threshold and then it jumps uh, to one. So also again, a very sharp transition. Uh, so we see that actually our neural networks learns these basis functions that are also on or off uh, at particular uh, regions. And well, a linear combination of well, these basis functions then allows me to make this uh, step function approximation. So these are just some examples of functions that we can approximate. And in practice, that's also what we're doing with regression problems, right? We want to recover some, some, some function mapping. We do not know it, but we have these input output pairs and that's what we recover. And basically our universal approximation theorem says that, well, if my network is deep enough or if it's wide enough, at least uh, I would be able to represent it. And now the challenge is of course, to actually find uh, this particular model. Uh, using, for, for example, gradient descent optimization of some uh, loss. Uh, I'll talk about it in, in the upcoming videos, but that's essentially what we're doing here, function approximation. Okay, and then I want to uh, give this example again, go back to this ReLU uh, approximations, because I really like this idea of, of piecewise linear uh, function approximation and the idea that we have these basis functions uh, that are learned uh, in this process. So this is the result if I want to uh, approximate the sine wave uh, with a two layer uh, neural network uh, with only three hidden units. And so this is when I trained it and it converged. And this is for example, what I start off with. So I initialize with some random weights um, and biases, and then I'm going to minimize some loss function. So I make all these errors and I want to minimize these errors. And that's a criterion that I'm minimizing. And then I apply some iterative scheme over here and you see that my basis functions start to adapt to something useful, right? And we also see that the points where these uh, piecewise linear functions transition uh, exactly take place at the point where my basis functions are uh, active or inactive. Okay, but it cannot come perfectly close, right? Because it's too simple a model. Uh, for example, especially here, I, I'm making some errors. So 
Um, if we really want to improve our representation uh, or approximation, then we really should increase the number of, of hidden units in our network. So that's shown over here in, on, in the right figure, right? So let's say I initialize my model randomly with a set of weights. So each, uh, let's say, basis function gets its own slope and an offset. Uh, and then I start uh, this learning process and I'm going to optimize my weights iteratively. And you see it nicely converges to the actual signal. And again, we see that we actually have learned all these nice basis functions with a particular slope and a particular offset, like an on off uh, location, and that determines these uh, transition points. Okay, but this is just essentially another example of uh, my universal approximation theorem at work. Where of course, it's the fact that I worked with ReLU activation functions to obtain these nice uh, piecewise linear uh, approximations. So all this was talk about regression essentially, but function approximation also takes a role in the classification with neural networks, right? So uh, let's suppose I have this data and it's drawn from some underlying distribution and these underlying distributions determine a true decision boundary. So that's what you see in green. So in green is what you see the, where the true posterior distribution for X equals the posterior distribution for uh, class two. So these decision boundaries are essentially obtained as the, the zero level set or some level set of a, a function that we are now going to approximate. Okay, so this is then a classification problem where the blue points correspond to class one, for example, and the red points correspond to class two. So then again, let's think about what we're doing. So we're, um, how many inputs do we have? Well, we have two inputs. We have this two-dimensional data set. Um, how many output units do I need? So I'm now designing my neural network, right? So how many output units do I need? Right, I actually only need one output, right? Because I have this uh, binary classification task. So the probability for the other class is given by one minus my probability for the first class. I could still encode this with actually two outputs and then work with a softmax, uh, but this is completely unnecessary, right? It's a waste of, of parameters. Uh, so I only consider one uh, output and I'm just going to make a choice to work with only two uh, hidden units and I'm going to work with a 10H activation function and because I'm considering classification my neural network should, should spit out a number between 0 and 1 because my prediction should, should represent some probability so my output activation is going to be sigma the sigmoid Okay, so then my objective is, is, is really to, to recover this true posterior uh, distribution. And okay, now I'm, I'm training this neural network and this, this red line is what comes out. So this red line is obtained via my uh, two layer neural network with only two hidden units. Okay, so this is a very simple approximation. It does make this uh, division quite okay, but if I want to really improve on this, uh, so essentially, if I want to reduce my epsilon in my function approximation, recall that I'm approximating this function now with a neural network, then essentially this tells me in order to represent such complex shapes, I should increase the number of uh, hidden units. Okay, to conclude, uh, we can formulate regression as well as classification problems as uh, function approximation problems, where in the regression case, we really want to recover the true function map mapping between input output pairs. And in classification, we can consider it as approximating uh, my uh, posterior distributions. Uh, then the universal approximation theorem then says uh, that if I go deep enough or if I have enough hidden units, then at least I would be able to, to represent this, this true function. And now the challenge is, of course, to actually find this function. So now we're talking about optimization and minimizing error functions. And that's going to be the topic of the, the remaining videos on neural networks. Now that we familiarized ourselves with the concept of neural networks, uh, let's try to actually do machine learning with it. Now the starting point of any machine learning task is to describe the problem that you're going to solve and define how you are going to quantify the performance of your algorithm. Or put differently, you need to define a loss function or an error function that you want to minimize. Now in this video we briefly summarize the choices you should make when working on regression and classification problems with neural networks.
So the setting is that we are provided with this uh, data set of, of measurements of data points and we want to do something useful with it. And in regression and classification problem, we also have targets uh, associated with it. But the, the point is we have this data, we want to do something useful with it. Uh, so we're going to design these neural networks that map these inputs to some output. And we can make a very uh, complex design over here that, that's up to you, uh, be creative with it. Uh, but, but now we're going to focus on the outputs and optimizing or actually training such neural networks. Uh, we're going to focus on how to find these uh, Ws. So the general steps is uh, define the number of outputs. This is basically given by the problem that you're going to solve, multi-class uh, classification or regression. So that defines the number of outputs. Uh, we also need to define an output activation function. Um, I'm going to say in the next slide how we are going to choose the output activation functions. Uh, but all of this is really motivated by what kind of loss function we're going to minimize. Now in this video, uh, we're going to use a probabilistic interpretation of the network outputs in order to, to make decisions on these choices that we need to make. And these choices depend on the problem that you're working on, right? So um, now let's first consider the regression problem. So the setting is we have all these input points. Uh, so each input is a d-dimensional vector and we want to map them to a corresponding target. And this corresponding target can take on any value on the real line. So now again, we resort to this probabilistic interpretation. So we have this uh, true uh, model that we want to recover that maps every x to a particular uh, target t, uh, but we have measurement noise, so we have uncertainty to take into account. Um, so instead of making just one point prediction, we consider uncertainty in our predictions with these uh, assumed uh, target distributions. And so far we've been modeling these target distributions via Gaussian, so via uh, normal distribution. So um, the probability for a given target, given my input parameters, is parameterized by this mean. So this is the model that we want to recover and there's some uncertainty on my predictions because I know my measurements aren't perfect. So that's described by this uh, variance or inverse uh, precision. Uh, but essentially we're making a prediction. So this Y, that's the model that we're going to recover and that models really uh, the mean of my uh, predictions. And now in this neural network setting, this thing is precisely the thing that we're going to model uh, with a neural network. Okay, uh, so that's the problem, that's the overall strategy. And then the set, so, don't, so then we're building a neural network that maps a single, uh, well, or a, a multi-dimensional input, so a d-dimensional input to a single target. So that also means that I need one single output unit, um, which is uh, given by my, so that's my final output activation and I need to apply, I need to make a choice on what activation function I should apply to my final uh, output activation. And since my targets are real valued, so they can take on any value on the real line, uh, maybe I do not want to apply any uh, activation function because, well, this uh, activation of the output is already some number somewhere on the real line. So when we talk about regression, we usually do not apply any activation function uh, to my output. Okay, so that defines a neural network. And then now, since we consider this in a probabilistic setting, we assume these target distributions. And then of course, we want to maximize uh, the likelihood, which corresponds to minimizing the negative log likelihood. So the error function uh, that I want to minimize, such that I get an optimal model, an optimal neural network, is given by uh, the negative log likelihood. Okay, and now we've seen this thing before, right? So we, we take the log of, of this normal distribution, essentially, and that gives me this quadratic term. And these are factors that do not contribute to my error as a function of W, right? So equivalently, we can uh, minimize this sum of squared errors. Now let's take a look at uh, the case of binary classification. So we have these input uh, factors Again, uh, d-dimensional, but now my targets uh, can only take on the values uh, 0 or 1. And uh, again, we adopt this uh, probabilistic viewpoint on things. So we are going to say that my outputs, so my model, uh, this is my neural network. So this is my neural network, that it models the probability of my target 
uh, value taking my target taking on the value one. So uh, again, we assume uh, a target distribution which we want to model, and we're now modeling uh, the Bernoulli distribution essentially. So my model spits out uh, the probability for class one, and that also implicitly gives me the the probability for the other class. And then we can use these labels uh, T to have this selection mechanism over here, right? So this is essentially uh, a Bernoulli distribution, um, which gives me the probability for class uh, one versus uh, the other class. Okay, so then if I have to decide uh, my output layer, how many, uh, how many neurons to put there, how many units, uh, so we're really assuming a single target, which represents my, uh, the probability for class one. So uh, my neural network only needs one single output unit. So he denoted with A out, and we need to apply some activation function to it. Now, what would this activation function be? Now the targets are binary and the targets represent probability. So uh, they, they really, the outputs, my model spits out a value between zero and one, or that's what it should do. And that's why we're going to rely on the sigmoid activation function because my model should represent the probability for uh, the target being one, and it should take on values somewhere on the range zero to one. Okay, so that motivates why we should use uh, the logistic sigmoid. Now again, because we adopt this probabilistic approach to modeling, uh, the natural choice to quantify how well my uh, probabilistic model performs is really to take a look at the likelihood, right? The likelihood that my probabilistic model actually describes uh, the data or the other way around that my data is described by such a probabilistic model. Uh, so we take a look, we want to maximize the likelihood, which corresponds to minimizing the negative log likelihood. And for uh, the logistic sigmoid case, uh, the log of my probabilistic models boils down to the cross entropy loss. So I want to minimize the sum over all my data points, the target the n times the log of my model plus one minus, so that's really the target for the other class, the log of one minus y x n. So this is my model. Okay, so when we're doing binary classification with neural networks, then my output uh, is a, a single output, uh, which is activated via the logistic sigmoid. And as loss function, we're going to minimize the cross entropy loss. All right, and then of course, we can also consider classification with K classes. So my input is again a d-dimensional vector, but now my targets now my target is also a vector. So for each data point n, I have a target that looks like this. So tn2, tnk, where each of these targets for each class, so for each data point n, I have k of such uh, targets, which take on the value zero or one. And this was uh, what we call the one hot encoding of my class, right? So with a one, hot encoding only uh, the, the the target for my uh, Kate class takes on the value one and the rest is zero so this is a one hot encoding of the Kate class so the one hot encoding really encodes these true probabilities right so if um, the, it represents the Kate class and the probability for all the other classes is zero uh, but it's one for that particular class and now we want to recover such probability vectors that so you want to really predict for each input x, um, well, the corresponding uh, class probabilities. So we want to um, sort of model this uh, target distribution. And this target distribution is then a generalized Bernoulli distribution. So let me write that out. So it's really the product of all uh, probabilities for each class, but selected uh, via this uh, one hot encoding, right? So um, if I'm considering the Kate class, then only uh, the Kate model is active, right? So that gives me the probability for class K. So that's what we're trying to recover. So uh, uh, this probability distribution that we can test for every class uh, K, we can check what the probability is uh, for that class. So that's essentially given in this form um, where each yk represents the probability for that class and the particular distribution that you see over here is typically referred to as uh, 
the generalized Bernoulli distribution. Okay, so this means that now I have k targets, right? I have k of these probabilities that I want to predict. So this means if I want to design my neural networks, I should design it in such a way that it has k output units. Um, and these, so these output units represent the probabilities um, and they're obtained by applying some activation uh, function to my uh, output activations. So now we're considering uh, we want to predict probabilities. So that means that the sum over all my probabilities should equal uh, one, right? So this is what I want. I want the sum over all my uh, classes. So the probability for class K given my input X, which is modeled via my neural network. I want this sum uh, to sum up to one. And this is ensured by the softmax, uh, softmax activation function. So we saw before that this is uh, the, the generalization of the logistic sigmoid, right? Uh, with multi-class uh, classification problems, we can always formulate our probabilities in, in, in the context in the form of such a softmax uh, function. Okay, so that really describes my overall model architecture. I want to predict k output units and I want to use the softmax uh, activation function to really obtain my final probabilities from uh, the output activations. And now the corresponding uh, error that we want to minimize is of course again going to be the negative log likelihood of my uh, probability distribution. And that in the softmax uh, case again it gives me the cross entropy loss. So I'm going to sum over all uh, data points. So from n is 1 to n. And then I'm going to sum over all my classes, the true target TNK times the log of my prediction for that particular class. So this is uh, the cross entropy loss. This is the cross entropy loss associated with the, the, the K dimensional generalized Bernoulli distribution. So this is the loss that we're going to minimize. Okay, this then summarizes what we did, right? So we considered regression and we considered classification and now we want to design neural networks and define the loss functions that we want to minimize. Now in the regression case, in all cases we approach this from a probabilistic viewpoint. Now in the regression case, we assume a Gaussian target distribution because there's uncertainty in my predictions. And then I let my neural network make a prediction for the mean of these uh, distributions. And so that actually also tells us because this mean can take on any value on the real axis that my output activations, I have one output activation and it's activated with the identity activation function. And these ingredients together then tell me if I want to maximize uh, the likelihood associated with this uh, target distribution, I'm going to minimize the least squared error. Now for binary classification, we assumed a Bernoulli target distribution. So we really, my neural network makes a prediction for the probability for class one. Uh, and then the probability for both classes is given by this uh, at Bernoulli target distribution. And this also tells me that we want to work with uh, as output activation uh, function, uh, we want to work with the logistic sigmoid. So these ingredients together tell me that my loss that I want to minimize is going to be the cross entropy loss. And likewise, in the multidimensional case, we assume a uh, generalized Bernoulli distribution for K uh, classes and my neural networks I guess makes a prediction for each of these classes. And to ensure that my output predictions are indeed uh, can indeed be interpreted as probabilities, we need to apply a softmax function on all these output uh, predictions. Uh, and then again, we want to maximize the likelihood and this eventually boils down to minimizing the cross entropy loss. Now that we know how to design neural networks and are able to define uh, the loss that we want to minimize, let's recap how we can minimize losses via stochastic gradient descent. In this video, we're going to look at what it means to perform stochastic gradient descent in the context of neural network training. Now the setting is that we have just defined our neural network. So we know how many output neurons uh, I need and we know which kind of loss I have to minimize. This could be, for example, the least squares uh, loss in regression or uh, the logistic loss or the cross entropy loss in classification problems. And now our objective is to find the most optimal set of 
uh, model parameters w that really minimizes uh, this error function. And so far we have been really lucky that our error functions were always convex. So that meant that if we apply some gradient descent method or whatever uh, alternative, we always end up with a globally optimal uh, set of parameters uh, that really globally minimizes my error function. But now with neural networks, with these complicated functions, which are highly nonlinear, I, no I no longer have this guarantee that my uh, error function is convex, which means that I can expect to observe several local minima in my uh, error landscape. And that is depicted over here. So this is my energy landscape and let's say I have two of such uh, valleys, uh, local optimal locations are these. So if I now apply gradient descent and I start at this point, for example, and I walk downhill, then I may end up in this local minimum and there's no way I'm going to get out of it because I just follow the gradient downhill. At this point, the gradient is zero and all my surrounding in my surroundings, all the gradients point uh, upwards, basically. So there's no way I'm going to ex escape my local minimum over here. And I do want that because I want to go to the most optimal uh, set of parameters. Um, so how do we reach this global minimum? Now, the short answer is we can. There's no way we can guarantee that we will end up at a global minimum. Uh, but we can try to avoid local minima as much as possible. And we are going to do this via uh, stochastic gradient descent. I'll explain this in a couple of minutes, how stochastic gradient uh, descent uh, helps with preventing to getting stuck in uh, local minima. But the challenge here is we are dealing with an error function which is not convex. Uh, so we have to deal with local minima. Now by far the most popular technique for optimizing or minimizing error functions in, in deep learning uh, is via stochastic gradient descent. And there's reasons for, for its popularity. First of all, it has a very simple update rule. Uh, it has a very simple update rule, maybe this one because in stochastic gradient descent, I only approximate my gradients with, with one data point or maybe a few data points. So it has a very simple update rule, efficient to compute, but it has some properties that also prevents um, the, the, the gradient descent of getting stuck at local minima. But before we get there, let's review what gradient descent does. So we start off with an initial estimate of my model parameters W. So tau is uh, my tau iteration. And then I'm going to find my new set of parameters W by walking in the negative gradient direction, right? Because the gradient point upwards and I want to go downwards. So I take a step in the negative gradient direction uh, with some step size eta. And as I just explained, we're dealing with an error function that has a lot of local minima. So we quite easily get stuck at such a local minimum. So let's take a look at uh, this figure, which I uh, drew in preparation and which I'm now going to fill in. So the setting is as follows. So this gray region indicates some error function as a function, let's say of two model parameters, W1 and W2. And I'm interested in obtaining this point over here. So this is my globally optimal uh, minimum. It's the lowest uh, error value I can find for all possible Ws. But then I have all these local minima, right? So uh, initially, of course, I do not know what my uh, optimal value will be. So I have to make an initial guess. And let's say uh, I start off with uh, this set of model parameters at, at tau is zero. So my initialization of the weights. Then what I'm doing with gradient descent, I'm going to make an estimate of this gradient or actually with full gradient descent, I make, uh, I actually compute the full gradient. So that's what this uh, arrow indicates. And I'm going to walk downhill and then again, check my gradient, walk downhill. Okay, so I walk downhill this land energy landscape or air landscape via gradient descent. And that actually leads to the result that I end up at this local minimum. And of course, if I would put my in initialization somewhere else, so maybe let's say over here, then a gradient descent will bring me to this local uh, minimum. And if I put my uh, initial weight over here, then maybe we would end up at the global optimal location. But because my energy landscape is, is highly non-convex, um, I'm bound to end up at some local minimum. Okay, so that's the issue with uh, regular gradient descent. And now we're going to consider stochastic gradient descent. And this means that 
Now, first of all, my error is uh, a sum of all these in individual errors. Uh, so that means I can also approximate my gradient by just computing the gradient for one data point. So the stochastic gradient descent method works as follows. So we choose some learning, some step rate uh, eta, we initialize, and then we sequen sequentially choose one point out of my data set randomly and use this, only this point to update my weights. Uh, so that gives me an estimate of, of the gradient based on the single data point and I'm going to use this uh, gradient to update my weights. And of course, instead of working with just a single data point, I could also maybe uh, average this gradient or take the sum of my error terms over a range of data points, uh, M. So maybe work with uh, 16 uh, data points to approximate my error. And that's what, and that is what you call a mini batch. So a mini batch of 16 of, su of such data points are, for example, used to approximate uh, the error. So I'm going to indicate that as follows. So I'm going to say that both of these uh, provide me an approximation of the gradient. So I'm going to de denote that with this uh, tilde over here. Okay, so now let's see how that would work. Um, I'm using this approximate gradient ID because now um, if I compute this approximate gradient at this point, for example, maybe it points in this direction because this energy error landscape looks slightly different for each data point. Maybe for one data point, it's more efficient not to change my Ws in this direction and for the other, it's efficient in, to do this in this direction. So for every data point, I would actually get maybe a different estimate of the gradient. So if I now do stochastic gradient descent, okay, I have a noisy estimate of the gradient. I take a step, I end up at this location. Again, noisy estimate. Uh, maybe it's somewhere over here. Maybe for this data point, it's in this direction. Okay, so I have these stochastic updates. And of course, that has still the chance that I end up at this uh, local minima. Huh? But because my uh, gradient estimate is so noisy, it could also be that at some point I estimate the gradient in this direction and take a step in this direction and then the next point. And so I am able to escape such local minima because these gradients, they look different for every data point. And that actually has the property that I'm able to escape local minima. And that could actually lead to the result that I'm I will end up at another local minimum, which is even lower than what I encountered just, just now. Okay, so that motivates why it would be actually a good thing to work with uh, approximate gradients via the stochastic gradient uh, descent method rather than working with uh, the full uh, gradient descent. Okay, so to continue on this comparison with uh, gradient and stochastic gradient descent. Well, first of all, both rely on this learning rate, right? And we saw that actually before in, uh, in our video on uh, gradient descent. So if the learning rate is too small, um, then basically it takes me a long time to, to end up at some local uh, optimal location. And in the stochastic gradient descent case, moreover, it may be more harder. It may be harder to actually leave such a uh, local optima because my step size are so small. So I always stay in this vicinity of this uh, local um, optimum location. But uh, conversely, if my step size is too large, then I completely jump over all these uh, optimal locations and I will never converge to, to anything. So what people tend to do is they tend to work with uh, a learning rate uh, schedule. Like they start off with a high learning rate. So that quite quickly brings me somewhere close to, let's say some optimal region. And then I decrease the step size and that brings me closer to the optimal location. And then I further decrease uh, So I really refine uh, my optimal solution uh, in the end. Okay, so these learning rate issues sort of both equally well apply to the gradient and the, the stochastic gradient descent uh, method. But then apart from the possibility to escape local minima with a stochastic gradient descent, there's another motivation for a stochastic gradient descent, and that's namely that they're much more efficient. So in order to compute this gradient, I only need to do this forward pass for maybe one or a few data points in my uh, mini batch. So this is uh, fast to compute. And if you would compare this maybe to uh, the full gradient, especially at the beginning, all of these gradients roughly point in the same direction because my initial solution is likely to, to be very poor, then, uh, then, then that means there's also a very clear direction to go to to improve my uh, solution.
And with this, I mean, if I have, for example, my initial point over here, so this is W0, then let's say my true gradient points in this direction. So that would be my uh, true uh, gradient. And then I have all these noisy estimates. Uh, for example, for data point um, one, the gradient for data point one, for example, points in this direction, uh, the gradient for data point two, maybe in this direction, so that it's a gradient of data point two, uh, maybe for uh, another one in this direction. So I have all these, well, noisy estimates, but roughly they, they all point in the same direction. So uh, especially at the start, I just want to have a, a course direction to follow and then just estimating this gradient with one data point would be enough to, to get me going in the right direction. So if you compare this to the full error, which is based on all data points, this is very expensive to compute, whereas uh, these gradients are only computed with a few or maybe even only one uh, data point. So this is super efficient uh, to compute. Okay, so that's summarized over here. I do not necessarily need the full gradient uh, because all my gradients are roughly aligned. So I can also make an estimate with one or a couple of data points. And then we saw this point that stochastic gradient descent is more likely to escape a local minimum since, uh, so if my total gradient would be zero, that means I'm not going to update my weights, but this does not necessarily imply that this gradient is the same for each data point, right? So if I visualize that again over here, let's suppose here, I have a true gradient, which is zero, but uh, because this landscape looks slightly different for every data point, it could be that maybe uh, for this uh, particular data point, my gradient looks like this. And that means I would take a step in this direction. And then again, there I have some uh, estimate. Uh, so, um, Working with these noisy gradients really uh, allows you to escape local minima. Okay, so those are some strong arguments uh, for uh, using stochastic gradient descent over a gradient descent. Uh, but maybe then there's an argument against a stochastic gradient descent. So let's compare the two in, in a similar situation. So what you would do with a gradient descent, you would really directly walk downhill and that would end you up at this uh, uh, globally optimal, or let's say some optimal location. Now what would happen in the stochastic gradient descent case, uh, because I have these noisy estimates, um, I am probably going to take a very roundabout route to my optimal location. So I would need much more uh, iterates to converge to uh, a local optimum. But then again, the advantage of a stochastic gradient descent is, is that these uh, gradients are super fast to compute because I only need one or a few data points, whereas here I need to process my full data set. So the point of this slide is that stochastic uh, gradient descent uh, requires more steps, but each gradient update is uh, fast to compute. Okay, uh, but then there's one final but very important uh, remark and that is that uh, because I have this uh, non-convex energy landscape, uh, my solution highly depends on how I initialize my model, right? So basically for every different starting point for my models, I may end up at a different uh, optimal location. And one sol final solution to which I converge to might be more uh, well, might be better than uh, the others. And that's nicely visualized over here. So this is a plot of the test error. So uh, test error. So the test error for different neural networks which with a different number of parameters. So uh, what is plotted here is the number of hidden units. And so, uh, so I'm training networks for different uh, network complexities. So 10 means I have a lot of hidden units. So my network is complex and therefore I, I can also expect more local minima in my uh, error function. And this is a very simple model and therefore I can expect a smoother or uh, let's say um, cleaner or nicer uh, error landscape. So then for each model, so for each model complexity, I randomly pick a new uh, initial seed, so uh, initial set of parameters W. And for my simple model, I see that 
all of these uh, solutions of all these models, they converge to the same model with a particular, which give a particular test error. But if I go for the higher models, then my error functions are highly uh, non-convex, so a lot of local minima. I see that my solutions uh, depend a lot on how I initialize. So some initial Ws end up converging to a very poor local minimum, so I still make a lot of errors. Uh, but some models, uh, they are able to reach a very, very good uh, local optimal location, and therefore they, they, they end up with very strong models. And, and that's sort of a general trend, right? So with local minima, you have more stable uh, optimization methods um, because there's not much model complexity and not much variation really among my models. But if I go to very complex models, uh, then um, I tend to end up at, at local optimal locations. And then really the difference between this very complex, good working model um, is there with, with, with the same complex model, but now with a poor solution. So we have these high variations in test error. Okay, so this, this also means that always, whenever you report uh, your errors or your performance scores with neural networks, you, sh you should always um, rerun your training procedure with different initializations of W. Because uh, if you run it once and you end up with a model which is very accurate, uh, then you report it and you say, hey, yay, I, I got state of the art. Um, but maybe then someone re-implements your method and then discovers the way that you were just very lucky. Um, I actually end up with this model. So um, be fair about the numbers that you report and um, also report uncertainties on your performances. So the message is... So always run with several initializations because this allows you to gain some understanding on the uncertainty on your models. Okay, so that wraps it up for um, neural network optimization via stochastic gradient descent. Um, currently, stochastic gradient descent is really the method to optimize your neural networks uh, because they're so simple and they have these properties that, well, uh, they have ways of escaping local minima. But still, there's, this is not a guarantee that you won't end up at local minima. In fact, you're super likely to end up with a local minima. And that leads that you, to the fact that you also can expect variability in your models. The most popular way for training neural networks is via stochastic gradient descent. This optimization method updates the weights iteratively based on the gradient of the error that we want to minimize. Now in this video we are going to explicitly write out how to compute the gradients in neural networks. And it, it turns out that even though neural networks can be incredibly complex, the computations of gradients themselves is actually quite tractable uh, because it can be sequentially obtained via a consistent application of the chain rule of differentiation. Now, just as the activations in a forward pass can be computed by evaluating the activations layer by layer, also the gradients in each layer can be sequentially computed by backpropagating the errors from the last layer all the way down to the first layer. Now, since the multidimensional chain rule plays such a central role in this uh, optimization framework, let's take a look what it actually says, this multidimensional chain rule. We use this rule when we have to deal with uh, multidimensional functions, so that it's a function of multiple input parameters, and each of these inputs, that's denoted with uh, g indexed with some uh, subscript d, each of these inputs is in turn again a function of another input. So let's put it like this, so we have all these, let's call them coordinates, each coordinate depends on some parameter x, and uh, my function f is again a function of these uh, coordinates, right? Now, if I want to compute the derivative of such a function with respect to x, so the, let's say is the lowest um, parameter in the hierarchy, then we have to apply the chain rule as, as we've used to, but now we work in this multidimensional setting. So I have to take into account the influence of a change of parameter x on all these input parameters. So that's roughly what it says. So I'm taking the derivative of f with respect to x, which can be thought of as um, the influence of a small change in x on the value of f. Then the change that this a small delta x change induces is going to be a sum of the, of, of, the, of the effect of changing x that it has on the d coordinate 
times and this is the chain rule essentially of f with respect to that particular coordinate right so all these changes on these coordinates uh, add up via the chain rule to a total change on my final uh, function f okay so that explains the multi-dimensional chain rule now, now let's try to translate this uh, to the context of our neural networks uh, first start off by recalling that my neural network is actually a nested function. It's, it's a function after function after function, um, roughly looking like this. So I have a neural network as a function of an input x, and it's obtained by, let's start it on the right, so by first applying this linear transformation in the first layer uh, on x, so that gives me the activations of the first layer. Then we apply some nonlinearity to it, then again some uh, linear transformation of the second layer, then again some activation function on it, and so on. So this means if you want to, if you were to compute the derivative of this neural network with respect to x, you have to apply a chain rule over here, right? So to propagate the errors, like the small changes that my x have on a to h to a to h, all the way to the effect of my final, the effect that it has of the small change on my final uh, output. Okay, now also recall that uh, my neural networks, like these functions, are uh, multidimensional functions, right? It's, it's mappings from uh, an input vector to an output vector. So this f could, for example, be um, one single activation, let's say the activation of at layer L. And this activation was given via a linear combination of all the, the, the activations of the previous layer, right? So if L minus 1, which again is a function of x, we have uh, the activation number two at layer L minus one, which is a function of X. And so we have all these activations. So we see that the, uh, the activation unit one at layer L is going to be a function of all these previous uh, activations, which are in turn a function of the input X. Okay, so each activation is a function of previous activations okay so that's denoted over here so my f could be uh, my first activation and it's going to be a function of all these uh, activations uh, at uh, the previous layer okay and that then tells me that if you want to compute derivatives uh, these multidimensional derivatives and chain rules we have to rely on this particular formula which uh, we will get back to at the point where we actually start using it but for now, uh, remember, this is the multidimensional chain rule. You should really remember this formula. Then uh, the setting is as follows. We have designed our neural network, uh, which is designed to, to transform an input to a particular output. Uh, so we make some decisions on, on the output, for example. And now my output um, is used to compute an error, right? So this output really defines the error. And then I'm going to compute the, the derivative of this error with respect to this model parameters W. So I apply some gradient descent method, for example, to update my weights based on the error that I computed, right? So I need to evaluate uh, the derivatives of my error with respect to these weights. So, and then I just said that I'm going to need to rely on the multidimensional chain rule, right? Because if I want to uh, measure the influence that this W has on the error, it has to propagate through all these layers up to my error. So I'm going to need this uh, chain rule. Now let's think about the flow of information. So what we're actually doing. So we have this input and this input information propagates forward, right? So it's used to compute the, the activations at the next layer. And then we again compute it at the next layer. So essentially the information at layer L is obtained by looking at information that was available at the previous layer. And um, we use this very simpler rule that we just work with this uh, linear transformations followed by applying this activation uh, function to each activation. And that would give me the hidden uh, units at that particular layer. Okay, so this is called forward propagation, really the propagation of information from the input all the way to the output. Uh, and in this process, we are essentially computing all the possible activations uh, at, uh, at the hidden units. Then what we're going to focus on today is going to be backpropagation. So the backpropagation of errors. So again, once I've done this forward uh, pass, 
then I know what my outputs are, I know what my error is, and that allows me to essentially compute a gradient in the end. And I'm going to start off with by computing the errors or the derivative at this layer, and I'm going to propagate these gradients all the way back um, well, to, to the first layer using this chain rule of differentiation. So that's the task of back propagation. The goal is to compute all derivatives. Because recall that it is our objective, right, to uh, in the end have access to all these derivatives because those can be used to, to update my weights via stochastic gradient descent, for example. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to compute all derivatives uh, of my error function with respect to my model parameters and uh, I'm going to evaluate this error based on some data point xn. Now it is important to realize that if we consider the, the derivative with respect to let's say this particular uh, model parameter w uh, j, j i then it's important to realize that a small change of this parameter leads to a change in the results only via this activation over here. So it only induces a change through this particular activation. So this means that I can compute this uh, derivative with respect to w, wji by the chain rule, right? Uh, because it only depends, it only, this error only passes through this a, uh, this jade uh, node. So I have to compute the, the derivative of my error with respect to this jade node. Let's mark that in red. And then of course the chain rule, I also need to compute the derivative daj dwji. Now the computation of uh, dA to dWji, that's simple enough, right? Because we have this, uh, this simple relation over here. It's just a linear combination of my uh, previous uh, activations. Then the tricky part lies into the computation of this uh, derivative uh, of my error with respect to the jade uh, activation. Because this jade activation, uh, this one, um, is used by all other nodes downstream uh, connected to it, right? So changing this uh, particular activation has an influence on all these other activations and, and therefore it has a more intricate um, contribution to the final error. Um, so for now we're going to keep it a bit simple and we're going to introduce a new symbol which we call the node error associated with the jade node. So we're going to just define it for now to be this error, which we're going to take a look at uh, later on. So delta is the derivative of my error with respect to this uh, j node, right? And we're going to denote it with delta j. So delta j is this node error, and it's an error that we place at the j node. So then it means that my uh, derivative with respect to w uh, w j i is given by this node error times delta a j delta w j i. So again, looking at these terms, this is what we are set out to compute. So we want to update our uh, model parameters w j i. For that, I'm going to need the error uh, with respect to my jade activation. So uh, I'm going to, for now, let's call this thing uh, delta j, the node error. And then of course we need the derivative of the node aj with respect to uh, wji. Okay, so let's focus on that one first. Um, so this is what we just did. So we said we want to compute this error and it's going to be given by delta j delta aj delta wji. And now we want to compute this particular term. So um, before I proceed, I just want to mention that I'm not going to write out all these uh, layer indices uh, all the time. And I'm going to use the index notation to refer to the layer. So whenever I'm talking about, um, well, my final layer in this particular chain that I'm considering, I'm going to use the index K. So all nodes uh, in this uh, layer will be indexed with, with the index K. And then if I talk about the layer before this, I'm going to use indices j and the layer before this. So let's say layer minus two is going to be re referred to with index i. So whenever I write uh, zi, this means this is a hidden unit corresponding to a layer l minus two. So this we have this ordering i, j, k going from layer minus two to minus one to my current layer. Okay, so with that said, uh, this hidden unit is based on the activation j, 
which is obtained via linear combinations. So I sum over i, the index in the previous uh, layer, w, j, i, the hidden units of that layer. Okay, so of this thing, I now need to compute the derivative with respect to w, j, i, and it immediately follows that, um, well, it's going to be z, i, right? So the derivative delta aj to delta wji is given by zi. Okay, that's uh, simple enough. Okay, so then this is what we currently have. That's uh, my error, uh, my derivative with respect to WG, wji of my error function is given by delta j. So the node error j times zi. Okay, and now we're going to focus on this particular term, which we call uh, the node error. So now we are going to actually compute this derivative. And to do this, recall that my final error is going to be determined by, by these nodes. And these nodes are again a function of uh, the, the aj, of the node of which I'm now currently computing this derivative. So if I make this a bit more explicit, I'm going to say that my error function, it depends on these nodes a k so the nodes in uh, in this layer and these nodes in turn depend on this jade uh, activation right so each node contributes to the error and each of these nodes in in turn are a function of the aj that i'm currently considering so now i can compute uh, the multi-dimensional chain rule so in order to compute this i'm going to use the multi-dimensional chain rule which tells me that this derivative is given by uh, sum over k, so all the parameters that depend on uh, my jade um, activation. So all these, so I'm sum over all these parameters a k. The derivative delta e with respect to this parameter delta e delta a k uh, times the derivative of this particular parameter to a j. So this is just applying the multi-dimensional chain rule. And of course, uh, these derivatives are maybe also hard to compute, right? So maybe we have downstream, we have more intricate re relations, uh, which I'm not going to focus on at the moment. So again, for now, I'm just going to say, I'm going to call this thing delta k. So the node errors at these um, um, nodes ak, at these activations ak. Okay, so to keep it a bit simple, I'm going to denote this as the sum over k, my node errors k times delta a k delta a j. So the derivative of my k node to the j activation. So this tells me if I want to uh, compute the error at uh, node j, then I'm going to need the errors at the nodes at my uh, higher layer uh, in the network, right? So, so we're going to have this flow of, of information that uh, the error at my higher nodes are going to contribute to the error of my lower nodes. So this is essentially the idea behind backpropagation. But just for clarity, I'm going to write out that indeed each hidden unit, let's say the ZJ is obtained by applying this activation, uh, this activation H, to aj, right? And, and the same for my uh, y case, it's obtained from my kate activation um, in, in that particular layer. Okay, so we are going to leave these node errors uh, for now uh, for what they are, and now we're going to focus on this derivative. Okay, so this is, now this is what we had so far, we were computing the derivative of my error with respect to wji, and this consisted of uh, the node error, the j node error times z i. And we were currently focusing on computing this particular term. And we saw that this particular term was obtained via a combination of my, let's say, upstream nodes, node errors uh, delta k. But in order to make this assignment, we need to compute the derivative delta a k to delta a j. So let's now just compute this thing. And recall that my AK, so my gate activation, is obtained as a linear combination from uh, the nodes um, at the lower layers, right? So the hidden units. Uh, okay, so let's just insert that. So these ZJs that are directly obtained, so let me just write it out. So each ZJ was indeed obtained 
by applying this activation unit, right? So let's just uh, fi fill this in. We're going to compute the derivative delta delta a j of this sum over j w k j and then apply this activation function to my j activation. And this derivative directly follows from the chain rule and it's given by w k j times derivative of this activation function with respect to its input evaluated at a j. Okay, so that's simple enough. We compute the derivative of ak to aj and that's given as follows. So my weight wkj times the derivative of my activation function. And this is something that you can uh, predetermine before you start making all this compute computation. Uh, I'm going to give some simple examples of what the derivative of activation functions look like. But now I have a, a way of computing these uh, delta j, so the node errors, the j node errors, simply by taking a uh, computing derivative of my uh, activation function at node j times the sum over k of the node errors at uh, the higher layers. So really I'm just following, filling in this formula, right? So we just computed delta a k delta a j uh, and that gives me this expression in the end. So that's, this clearly shows if I know the node errors at these higher layers, so delta k, delta 1, then I can obtain my node error at the node j simply via this update rule. So we have a flow of information, the flow of errors from the higher layers to the lower layers by multiplying each error with the corresponding uh, weight. So we have these higher node errors, which are multiplied by this weight WKI. And that together with the derivative of my activation function uh, gives me the error at node J. Okay, so this is something that we can actually compute, right? Because all these activations, we can compute them in the forward pass. Uh, these WKJs, we know their values and we also know how to take the derivative of my activation function. It's just filling this in and that gives me uh, the delta j. The only uh, starting point is actually computing the derivative at my very last uh, layers. And that's what I'm going to show uh, in the next uh, slides how to do this. It's, it's, it's actually quite simple. So once you know the, the, the node errors at the last layers, we can propagate these errors all the way down via this particular rule. Okay, so then uh, this, this update scheme, so the scheme for computing this derivative has a very clear structure to it, right? So we have this forward pass, and in this forward pass, we propagate the information from the input all the way to, to the last layer using just the definition of our network. So each node at AJ is obtained from the activation from the, from the lower layers by this linear transformation where each uh, note that the previous layer was activated by the activation function, right? So this sum of i. So this really is how we define the network to be. The activations at this layer are obtained via linear combinations of my uh, hidden units at the previous layer. Okay, and once I've performed this forward pass, I also know the node values at my output, right? And these node values then determine uh, the error. This also means that then now I can start computing the derivatives uh, of my nodes, of my error with respect to these nodes. Uh, specifically, you would start with computing the derivative, uh, the node error delta k. So at the outputs, I made these errors, and these errors were defined to be the derivative of my error function with respect to this particular node. And because my outputs directly determine the error, uh, we can simply compute this. Uh, which in the least squares error, uh, for example, boils down to yk minus tk. Right, suppose my error was given by uh, the sum of squared errors, or the squared error, tk squared, then um, the derivative of this thing would give me this. So I have a way of computing the errors at my output nodes. Okay, and then we also just derived a way for computing the derivative at the lower layer nodes via this update rule. So, okay, so now we can propagate these errors down to the lower layers uh, via this update rule. So the derivative of my activation at node j 
and then the weighted sum of my, all my uh, higher layered errors weighted with uh, my model parameters. Now I put this remark uh, down here because we have to, of course, be careful with, with skip connections. Um, so we could uh, have models that directly propagate information from here to here. Then of course we have to check for the links um, that, that, that contribute to, to this activation. So that means I'm summing essentially over all nodes upstream that are connected to the node that I'm currently updating. It's just something uh, to take into account. Okay, so that's essentially uh, the back propagation phase. So in the back propagation phase, I propagate errors from the end all the way down uh, to the lower layers. And then if I'm done with this back propagation, I also know what the derivative with respect to the model parameters W, J, I are, and that's simply given, that's one of the first things we derived. It's simply given by this node error Z, uh, delta J times uh, Z, I. And these derivatives can then in turn be used in your whatever optimization scheme that you use. But almost any optimization scheme uh, relies on this derivative. And now let's just take a look at uh, the gradient descent algorithm, what it does. It does, we update the, the node parameter uh, WJI. So at my next iterate is going to be the parameter that I already had. And then I walk in the negative gradient direction which was given by delta J times Z I. Okay, so really this summarizes everything. So in a forward pass, I make sure that all my activations uh, are computed and then I can start the backward pass and I just start off by first computing the error at my output nodes and then I uh, back propagate these errors to obtain also my node errors at the lower layers. Now, when I'm done with that, I not only have all the activations, I also have the node errors, and then I can start computing the derivatives simply by taking the product of my node errors with um, the actual hidden activations. And this in turn can be used to update my weights in an iterative uh, update scheme. Okay, now I'm going to end this video with some examples. Um, so depending on your error function, maybe your errors may look slightly different. Uh, but we already saw actually for a particular class of activations and uh, targets that we optimize, we always end up with this very simple form of the node error at the outputs. For example, if we consider logistic regression, then we typically minimize this least squares error function and the derivative of this error function with respect to y is simply given by this difference. So this is the error that my target makes with respect um, uh, to the target, so the error that my prediction made makes with respect to the target. And a similar thing happens if we consider classification and uh, we use as error function the cross entropy loss. We computed this in the previous videos, we computed the derivative of the logistic sigmoid, which is the two class version of this thing. And then we saw that we end up with a very similar error. All right, so that's simple enough. And these are then the errors that we use to start off our back propagation. Now a final note on uh, which kind of activation functions you could use and what this would look like. Um, this is an example. Let's consider this two layer neural network. So a two layer neural network, which maps an input to some uh, k-dimensional output vector by passing it through one hidden unit uh, layer uh, directly to the output. And let's consider uh, the regression problem. So I'm not going to apply an output activation uh, to my outputs, um, but as for the hidden units, they will be computed by the 10 H, uh, the hyperbolic tangent. So my activation uh, function will be the 10 H. Now this 10 tangent hyperbolic is given as follows and it has a very nice derivative. So this is what I'm dealing with. So this is my activation function And it has the following derivative. So this derivative, uh, we need this when we uh, apply our back propagation, right? And we talk about regression. So we have this uh, quadratic error function. And we just saw that if we compute the derivative of this error function with respect to node uh, yk, then it's just simply given by the, the, the difference uh, between my prediction and the target. So I have my node errors at the output node. So now I can start back propagation.
And recall that the back propagation, uh, so the back propagation rule was given uh, by, well, the fact that I need the node errors at the, the last layer. So that's what I have. I also have the current weights, but they also need to compute the derivative of my activation function. So let's just fill this in. So the derivative of the tangent h is this thing, one minus um, the hidden unit squared. So one minus the hidden unit squared and then times uh, the rest of it. So this is really my update rule, which I'm going to use to propagate the delta case down uh, to the lower layers. So step one is this forward propagation. Then step two, uh, compute these node errors and propagate them backward uh, via this back propagation to obtain the node errors at the lower uh, nodes. And since we're now considering a two layer neural network, I only need to compute uh, these uh, nodes at, at this layer, right? Because um, I do, I do not have any weights at this point, so I do not need any node errors at this point. Right, so once I've computed all these delta j's, I'm essentially done with my back propagation. And then I can simply compute uh, the derivatives of my error functions with respect to my model parameters uh, via this update rule, which was given by uh, the node error times the node of this uh, previous layer. And that's explicitly given as follows. Okay, so that wraps it up for error back propagation. So this entire scheme uh, summarizes how to compute uh, your gradients in the end. Um, I would recommend just take your time, go over this example uh, after the video, uh, but whenever you have to implement this or whenever you need to know how to compute the gradients, just follow this scheme. We have a forward pass, moving all information forward. That allows me to compute all the activations uh, in my neural networks. Then I need to compute the error that I make at the output and I can propagate it backwards uh, via this uh, simple update rule. And that in the end gives me an expression for the derivatives, which in turn can be used uh, to, to update my weights, for example, via a stochastic gradient descent. So far, we have covered supervised learning methods in the context of regression and classification. We now move on to the class of unsupervised machine learning methods. So this is what we've been dealing with in the supervised setting, right? So far, we've always worked with data of the form uh, input output pairs. So we have a set of measurements X and the corresponding targets. And now we want to come up with um, either predictive distributions, like given a new data point X, what is the probability of observing a corresponding target T? Or we approach it from a discriminative uh, setting um, and let's say a non-probabilistic setting and where we just want to model the relation input to output and we just model that by recovering some function f that performs this task and then we subdivided this uh, class of supervised learning methods into regression and classification problems where in the regression setting uh, my targets took on continuous values so anything any value on the real line so there was a regression problem uh, but we also considered classification problems where the target could only take on one out of a specific set of values and this target represents maybe a class. And now in the upcoming videos, we move towards unsupervised machine learning, where we have all this data set, this data set of observations X, but without a clear uh, target, which we want to, to recover. And now our goal is to do something useful with this data. We want to uncover the structure of the data, or maybe we want to infer uh, maybe hidden class labels. Maybe there are targets which we do not observe, but which we know that there, there, there should be such targets. And a first goal could be, for example, density estimation, where we simply want to reconstruct the probability density that generated this data set. This could, for example, be useful uh, for outlier detection. Uh, suppose I now observe a new X and I want to know um, well, the probability of observing this X and if it's highly unprobable, then maybe it's an outlier and there's something wrong with your detection system. I don't know, uh, could be anything, uh, but we could also use this probability to generate new data points in, in a simulated environment, for example. But maybe more interestingly, and that is what we're going to focus on in the upcoming videos, is the notion of a latent variable. And this latent variable Z, so let me denote this, let Z be a, a latent variable that influences uh, 
how we observe how we observe x and that's actually better represented by this uh, probability uh, distribution over there this conditional probability and the idea is as follows so suppose i have this whole a data set of, let's say, real estate related measurements. So uh, things like house prices, um, the size of the property, the size of the garden. Uh, those are all measurements related to a house on the real estate market. And so we have all these measurements uh, stacked in this uh, data set X. And maybe now we want to infer some structure of this data because you can imagine that maybe some of these values are highly determined by maybe the city in which the property is located. Uh, some cities, they well, uh, have bigger houses and more expensive houses and some cities only have tiny houses, I don't know. Uh, so we want to recover the structure such that maybe in downstream tests we can rely on the structure for making particular decisions. So we then call this unobserved variable set, this latent variable, it, it is unobserved, but we sort of assume and maybe even know that there is such a latent variable. There is such thing as a city which influences uh, all these measurements. And now um, the task could be maybe to recover this kind of structure and uh, recover the, the different cities that there are. Now such problems would relate to clustering. So uh, clustering my data points based on this latent variable. And in this case, the latent variable would be, for example, uh, the city. But we can also use um, unsupervised learning for dimensionality reduction. Suppose I have this whole set of measurements like house price, house price property size, uh, garden size, a lot more. And maybe they can re be reduced to one or a few values. Uh, for example, maybe just knowing the property size uh, tells me a lot about the actual house price and the garden uh, size and stuff like that. So that's also going to be part of unsupervised learning is sort of uncover this structure that govern my data such that I can deal with less uh, parameters in the end. Now in the upcoming videos, we're going to talk about a lot about latent variables. So it will become a more clear um, uh, very soon. But, it is, but this is roughly the idea behind it. We have this observed variable X and that's the data basically. So we have all these X's, but we also have unobserved latent variables that influence how my axis came to be. And that is graphically depicted over here. And in formulas, it's constructed as follows. So we assume that there's such a structure of a latent variable influencing uh, my x. So my final probability of observing x is determined via this adjoint of observing an x with this uh, hidden or latent variable, which we do not know. Uh, but we can marginalize out this uh, z once we have this joint to obtain my probability for x. Okay, so that's how we do this. We assume there is such a latent variable and therefore there's such a joint uh, probability distribution. And that also means that we can make this factorization, right? Of, uh, so this joint is given by uh, the conditional of x given uh, my latent variable uh, times the, the prior or the probability for z uh, in itself. Suppose I'm given such a latent variable, uh, then this tells me a lot about uh, what kind of values for x I can expect. And if I have a different latent variable, I have a different distribution for x. So uh, we have this uh, latent variable conditional distributions. And then of course, in order to reconstruct this joint, I am also am going to need a prior or some probability for this latent variable in itself. Okay, so that's the, the continuous situation and the same for the discrete setting, right? So when I talked about uh, predicting these house prices based on the cities, now Z could be my discrete latent variable. It could be city number one, city number two, etc. And then uh, my overall probability for pr making a prediction for a particular house price uh, can then be uh, obtained by uh, summing the probabilities for a particular house price X, for example, summing over all the probabilities uh, in all the cities, essentially. I hope this example somewhat makes sense, uh, but maybe we just move on to another example. Um, I talked about this clustering, like uncovering the structure of my data. And suppose all these points over here are all different measurements. Let, let's go to a different example. Let's say these measurements represent, uh, we're observing animals and these X's represent, for example, uh, well, the height of the animal and the weight, something like that. So we see sort of see this correlation when we see, observe bigger animals, we also observe higher weights and then we make this assumption that we're measuring actually, maybe we, maybe we make this assumption because we look at this data and we see roughly two clusters. So it's a bit dense over here and here, and there seems to be a separation here. So now we can maybe assume that we're actually dealing with two types of animals. 
So that would be my latent variable. For example, the latent variable could be, um, I don't know, animal type. And I said uh, the horizontal axis was uh, height. The vertical axis was weight. So then once we make this uh, assumption that there is a latent variable, namely the, the animal type, um, that influences my observations, then maybe it becomes more easier to actually model this uh, distribution that generated all these data points. Uh, meaning that I'm going to assume that my the probability for a particular observation X is going to be given by the marginalization over this joint uh, PX and my latent variable, where I made this factorization of um, a probability of X given my um, animal type times the probability of observing that animal uh, type uh, in the first place. So suppose my latent variables are uh, cats and dogs, I'm only measuring cats and dogs. Then uh, suppose I'm measuring a dog, then maybe I assume the probabilities of observing a particular weight, width and height is given as follows. So dogs are typically heavier than, than cats, for example. Uh, so assume maybe a width and a, a height somewhere around this point, And then of course we have some spread uh, around this. One dog is uh, larger than the other. And so maybe there's such a distribution for cats as well. So uh, let me draw that. So let's say the average cat has some height and weight corresponding to a point over here and then there's some spread around it uh, like <laughs> not every cat is the same so then we have identified two distributions in our latent variable modeling uh, approach where uh, the first one correspond to uh, the probability for my width and uh, my weight and height measurements given that um, i'm observing a dog and with the other de density, I'm modeling basically the width and height, um, given that I'm uh, observing a cat. So now I split the problem into modeling uh, two separate distributions, which are uh, separately easier to model, uh, but they still give me the information that I'm after, namely the probability for making an obser observation X. So uh, via this marginalization process, by marginalizing over um, well, cats and dogs, uh, essentially. And then via this marginalization, I would be able to recover the probability distribution uh, for the data that I uh, just observed. Okay, so that's essentially the idea about unsupervised learning uh, with latent variable models. So we assume that there is such a latent variable that influences how my data is generated. And now I'm going to use this to, well, to apply structure to my modeling uh, approach and to uh, my data essentially. And in this case, you could think of it as a clustering approach because we sort of group all these points together with one latent variable model and cluster the other points with another model. And now this also means with uh, such a probabilistic interpretation that maybe I can, given a new data point X, I can try to infer uh, which class, which latent variable class it would belong to. And uh, because now this point has a higher probability in uh, the, the conditional uh, class for cats, I can probably tell that this uh, data point belongs to the measurement uh, of a cat. Okay, and then we can also um, use this idea of latent variable modeling uh, for dimensionality reduction. For example, in this right figure, suppose I have all these 2D measurements, so all these points over here. Uh, we see that in this case, they are nicely concentrated along this, this red curve. So what I'm actually looking at is actually a one-dimensional um, manifold or one-dimensional data structure where my latent variable could, for example, encode for a particular point along this line. And that would actually then tell me also, well, um, what my observation in terms of these 2D data points would be. And that will be the main idea about working with continuous latent uh, variables to use it for dimensionality reduction and sort of to recover the underlying structure of my data with well continuous latent variables. And this will be uh, covered in uh, the next lecture, uh, so in the video series uh, numbered with 10. Uh, but Today, uh, in the upcoming videos, we're going to focus on discrete latent variable models. And we're going to start off with uh, clustering in this non-probabilistic setting. So really focus on a classical k-means clustering algorithm. And later we move to a probabilistic setting, which 
uh, more closely models what we just uh, discussed in this example. Clustering falls in the category of unsupervised learning methods, uh, where we are set out to learn the structure of the data in terms of a discrete set of clusters. Now today we cover one of the most famous methods for clustering, namely k-means clustering. Now remember, we're talking about unsupervised learning, so we're considering data points uh, without targets, so just observation x, and that could be visualized as follows. Suppose we have these 2D measurements, uh, which results in this uh, green point clouds. And uh, now we're, what we're going to assume is, we're going to assume that there's a discrete latent variable, and this latent variable encodes for uh, the cluster or the, 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 the latent class, which we do not observe, but we sort of assume that there are that there is some latent variable that um, results in the fact that we are observing my data points in, in two clusters, uh, roughly. And now we're set out to recover this uh, latent variable. Now let's put it like this. All our observations, x, are drawn from this, uh, well, uh, probability distribution for x. So when I make an observation, sometimes it lies over here, sometimes it lies over here. Uh, but generally we tend to see these two clusters. So we're going to assume that there will be two clusters, uh, a discrete latent variable which can take on two values. And let's denote it as follows. So we have a latent variable z, which uh, either means it came from the blue class or it came from the red class. Then basically this means that my data point is either drawn from this uh, conditional x given um, well, I'm, I'm considering the red class, or we say my data point came from uh, my blue class. So I, then I have this conditional x given my blue class, where points drawn from this blue class are most likely to occur around this uh, blue cluster center. That's sort of um, the latent variable approach that we consider here. Now in this k-means clustering approach, we're actually going to discard the idea of probability. So we're not going to talk about uh, these probabilities. Uh, we're just going to perform this clustering, and but we can still talk about uh, clusters as being uh, latent variables, right? So this, yeah, so, so these latent clusters that uh, are responsible for particular sets of, of data points. So now, so now we're going to let go of this probabilistic interpretation, and for now, not talk about probability distribution, but we're going to make hard assignments. We're going to say that this point either belongs to this. A blue latent class or it belongs to the red latent class but our original data set in itself doesn't have this uh, latent variable information right we're only observing these x's and that's why we call it this this green so we do not encode for classes at this point but once we have done our clustering then we can look for new data points and make a hard assignment for the latent variable uh, blue versus red. And we're going to do this via the k-means clustering algorithm, uh, which is based on the fact that each cluster has its own mean. So the cross over here is called, uh, well, let's say the mean for cluster one, and then this cross is going to be the mean for cluster two. And then whenever a new data point comes in, this x for example, we're going to check which mean is closest, and then we simply assign a point to that uh, class. All right, so that is what we're going to do. And then the k-means clustering algorithm works as follows. We can formulate it as a minimization problem. So we, what we're dealing with is all this, this data set of observations xn, and we're going to cluster them. So those are those uh, green points. And we're going to cluster them into two groups, for example, or let's say in k uh, clusters. Now we can do this by minimizing the following um, error function or loss function. And now this error will be a function of my cluster means and uh, the labels that I assign to each uh, data point. So each point is going to belong to one of the clusters that's encoded via these uh, latent variable assignments z and k, where each uh, z and k, so for each data point n, I consider k classes, and this value is either zero or one. And that leads to a sort of one-hot encoding of my um, latent variable uh, classes. Meaning that my latent variable uh, set and k looks like this. So my end uh, latent variable looks like uh, set n1, set n2, up to set n k. 
and this factor consists of zeros and ones where it is only one for uh, the class to which it is assigned to, right? So it's a one hat encoding of uh, the Kate class. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to assign each data point to one of the classes via this one hot encoding um, of my latent variable. And I'm going to do that in such a way that my total error is going to be minimized. So that means for a fixed uh, K, for a fixed cluster K, I'm going to pick a mean. And then for all points in this cluster, I'm going to sum over the square distance from this point to this mean, right? Because this thing is only one if, uh, well, if the Kate index is indeed one. So I'm only summing the errors uh, within one cluster. So going back to this uh, example, suppose I have a cluster mean mu is one, then I look for all points which are assigned to cluster one. And then I want this me uh, mean value to be placed at such a place such that the distance uh, of all points to this cluster mean is as, as small as possible. But this also works the other way around. Suppose I have fixed a certain mean, then I want to assign the points uh, to the closest mean because by making this assignment to the closest mean, I'm also going to minimize uh, this, this loss function. So I have two things that I'm going to change, uh, the means and the assignments. And this leads to an iterative optimization scheme uh, called k-means clustering, which is as follows. So we are going to initialize uh, the cluster means mu k with some random initialization. So this was my green data set and then I'm going to consider two classes. Uh, so I randomly place these two cluster centers over here. So that's step one, this initialization. Then I'm going to iterate the following. First of all, I'm going to make an assignment of each point uh, to the closest uh, cluster mean. So that's essentially uh, stated here formally, right? For each xn, I'm going to select the cluster. So I'm going to take the minimal cluster or the cluster that minimizes the distance. And that will be the cluster to which I assign this point to. So that looks like this. So I have this cluster points initialized like this, and these blue points are all closest to this one, and the red points are closest to this one. So this is the assignment step, which we are going to label as uh, the E step. I will explain in a minute why we call it the E step. So this will be step, the E step, the assignment step. And then once we make this assignment, we're going to update the means. So that's denoted with the M step, simply by taking the average over all my data points within a class. Remember that the set and case is, is only one for this data point when it corresponds to the K class. So I'm really summing only for a fixed K, I'm summing only for the points within that class and average over it. So uh, now I'm updating my cluster means. Okay, so this update step will be denoted with an M, the maximization step, and this leads to a new set of uh, cluster means, right? Um, so we have all these blue data points. We have slightly more blue points on this side than on this side. So my mean is somewhere over here. So that's what you see over here. And the same for the red, it's heavier on this side. So the mean over all my red points is going to be located over here. And now once I've done that, I again go to perform this E step or also the assignment step. And that gives me this new distribution of points. Now all points closest to blue to this cross will be marked as blue and all points closest to the other uh, cross will be marked as red. Okay, now we're going to iterate this. So once we updated our assignments, we're going to update again the cluster means. So that's the maximization step, the M step, and that gives me a new set of, of means uh, mu k. And again, we update our assignments by assigning each point to the closest uh, cluster mean. Then we again update our cluster means. Then we again make this assignment and so on. And we keep doing this until convergence. So at some point, the cluster means will not change anymore. Uh, so you see that this solution is exactly the same as this solution. Uh, so we reached convergence and we're done with the clustering algorithm. Okay, so this is a very simple algorithm consisting of an E step and an M step. And uh, we call this, this is a sort of instantation of the expectation maximization algorithm. So we call this the expectation step. And we call this the maximization step. And for now it is a bit artificial to call it the expectation and maximization step. But later on, we will consider a probabilistic version of uh, k-means clustering in which 
uh, this expectation has a particular mean and the maximization step also has a particular meaning. But for now, let's ju just use it as labels. So we have an E step in which we update the assignments of each point to the corresponding cluster. And we have an M step, uh, which is used to, to find the new uh, cluster means. And that describes this very simple algorithm where we have this assignment step, assignment step, uh, followed by an update or maximization step, update of the means. And we iterate this. And the nice thing about this algorithm is that with every step, so both with the expectation step, with the E step, or the assignment step, as well as with the M step, we reduce this error function that I defined before. And it keeps reducing until it reached convergence. I recall that our objective J is defined as J is the sum over all my data points, sum over all my clusters, Z and K times the distance of my end data point to uh, this particular cluster mean. So that was what my objective was uh, defined to be. And then we have this assignment step. And by definition of this assignment step, for, for each XM, we're going to select uh, the label set N such that this thing is minimized. So really by definition of this assignment, we're going to make a decrease in this uh, loss function. Okay, so that's essentially this assignment step. And once we've made this assignment, we're going to update the cluster means. And then again, this results in a decrease in this loss function because we're going to uh, choose uh, the means mu k such that this error is minimized within that cluster. And I'm going to show this in the, the next slides actually that this uh, maximization step or this M set really reduces uh, this uh, cost function j. But essentially what is happening here that after this M step, the majority of points within this cluster will get closer to the cluster mean. Okay, so we iteratively keep increasing this uh, loss function until it converged. So we're actually able to show that the k-means clustering algorithm will converge, but it actually is going to converge to a local minimum because as a function of both mu k and z and k, so these cluster means and the cluster labels together, uh, this loss function is uh, highly um, non-convex. And this uh, property of convergence to a local minimum is actually obtained by fixing a particular mu and then updating z and k, and then, and then fixing z and k, and then update the mu k, so this m step. So once this is fixed, this will become a quadratic loss as a function of mu k and hence a convex uh, optimization problem. So each of these individual steps solves some uh, convex optimization problem, but when we treat these, this loss as mu k and z and k together, uh, we're dealing with a non-convex uh, problem, which means that depending on my initialization, depending on where I place these points, I may end up with different um, partitionings uh, in the end. Okay, so this tells us that this k-means clustering will find a local minimum, but it is not guaranteed to find the global uh, minimum uh, assignment of, of points and uh, cluster means. And so the best thing that we can do is really work with random restarts. So uh, we start with different initializations and then we let the algorithm converge. We do this multiple times and in the end just select uh, the clusters which really minimizes a j over all these uh, random restarts that it did. So that's the best thing we can do. Just run this multiple times and in the end, uh, select a solution that really has the lowest uh, value for J. Now, what I'd like to show next is that this M step actually really minimizes this J. So we can derive this uh, step by uh, fixing uh, my uh, class labels or my uh, assignments, and then finding the mu K that really minimizes this convex optimization problem. And the approach that we've been taking so far uh, a lot of times is taking the derivative of this loss with respect to mu k, this is the parameter that we're going to update and set it to zero. So what would the derivative of this uh, quadratic uh, function be in terms of uh, mu k? Now, first of all, we know that this L is uh, a class index, right? So this mu L. Uh, so this derivative only does uh, something whenever L is the same as k, meaning that this derivative is only non-zero only when L is K and hence uh, this sum disappears and we can just fill in the K over here because that's the only case where uh, the derivative does actually do something. 
And then of course we can pull this derivative inside the sum, right? Because this sum in itself doesn't depend on k. Okay, that's uh, step one. And then the derivative of this quadratic form, we also computed that before. So what we're actually doing here is computing d, d mu k of xn minus mu k transpose xn minus mu k. And this will be equal to minus 2 minus 2 times xn minus mu k transpose. Okay, so uh, this is derivative and we, we set it to zero and now we're going to solve it with respect to the cluster means mu k. So that's what we're doing in this uh, bottom part. So we take the transpose on both sides. Uh, so actually we just get rid of this tra transpose essentially. We're going to split this sum and then we move this part, which depends on mu k, uh, to the other side. So solving this tells me that the most optimal uh, cluster mean values are obtained simply by taking the average over my uh, cluster points of my of my data points within this cluster. Because recall that the Z and Ks only take on the value one whenever my data, uh, my end data points uh, belongs to the K class. So really, I'm summing over my, my data points within this, this class and then I normalize by the number of points within this class. So re really this is taking the average over my uh, points in this cluster. So that explains that with this uh, M step, we're really minimizing our objective function here. So in that sense, maybe this M step can be interpreted as a minimization step, uh, but we call it a maximization step because when we move to the probabilistic setting, um, this M step actually solves uh, the maximum likelihood uh, of my probability uh, distribution. But that's something that we discuss in the upcoming video. For now, it's clear to know that the k-means clustering uh, algorithm minimizes uh, this objective j step by step uh, via in, both in the expectation step as well as in uh, the, the m step, in this case, a minimization step. Okay, now let's go over some applications of k-means clustering. In this first example, we're going to use it for image compression. And this is an example from the book of Bishop. And maybe it is a somewhat old fashioned or naive way for image compression, but it will get us started on, well, what kind of applications can be solved with uh, k-means clustering. Now, the idea is here to represent this image with as little data as possible. And we're considering the following problem. So we have uh, data points, which will be our cluster. So the xn's, each xn is one pixel, and this one pixel has an R, G, and a B value. So those are, are my uh, pixel values. Now, w instead of storing all these pixel values of all these RGB values, I'm only going to store uh, the cluster to which each point belongs to. So this point belongs to the blue class and this one to the yellow class. And then with this information, I can reconstruct such an image. But if I consider, let's say three different colors, uh, then this would be a representation that I can store uh, cheaply. And if I use 10 colors, basically I'm saying I want to represent this image with only 10 colors and I'm going to store for each pixel uh, which class color this uh, belongs to. Right, so we're going to cluster all these uh, color pixels into K clusters. K clusters, where each cluster represents um, is a color representation. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're just throwing all these color pixels into one big pile and then we're going to, and then we recognize that there are a lot of colors that are similar. So we're just going to group, we're going to cluster all these colors that are similar together. We call them uh, yellow, for example, and all these points are similar. We call them blue. And this allows us to compress the data because now I only have to store, let's say, I have all these pixel values. I only have to store, uh, let's say this pixel belongs to class one, this to two, this to class one, uh, etc. So I only have to store these uh, integer values at all these pixel lo locations. So suppose my pixel, my image contains X by Y pixels. Then now I only have to store X times Y um, integers, which represents uh, the classes. So these are uh, either uh, one or two, for example, in this two class case. Whereas in the original image, I would have to store all these RGB values. So RGB for one pixel, RGB for the other pixel, 
um, yeah, etc. So that would mean I would have to store x times y times three of such values, but also now my values, uh, so this number of values uh, in the range 0 to 255. So I have much more data to store. Okay, again, so this is maybe a bit naive way for image compression. There are way better methods uh, than this, um, but the idea is there, right? So we can use clustering also for compression and maybe also now in this image uh, segmentation or an analysis task also for segmentation because now pixels that are of similar color, they are clustered together. So we have sort of the segmentation of, let's say blue and, and yellow. Of course, a bit uh, silly method for segmentation because it doesn't take any spatial relations into account, right? Just similarities between colors. Okay, uh, enough for uh, about image compression. Um, there are also, also some limitations of k-means uh, clustering. And one of the main limitation is that k-means clustering only generates spherical clusters. So let's write it down, only generates spherical clusters. And this has to do with the fact that my clustering is based on distances of points to my cluster centers uh, based on the Euclidean distance. And then, well, uh, all points with equal distance to my cluster that forms a sphere, right? So with this kind of complex half moon data sets, uh, you will never make a, a proper uh, clustering with k-means clustering. Another uh, limitation of k-means clustering is that each cluster has the same size. So let me write it down, each cluster Each cluster is of equal size. And that's in this mouse data set. So this is sort of a, a Mickey Mouse kind of figure. So we have a face and, and two ears over here. Um, ideally, we want to cluster these ears uh, separately. And if you work with three classes, um, again, because we use this same Euclidean distance for each class, we end up with clusters of, of about equal size. And of course, we can increase the number of, of clusters. This sort of solves the problem because now um, each cluster is of about equal size and then these ears can be separated and then I would just need still need a way to, to cluster the face using these three uh, separate clusters. But that could be considered a limitation of k-means clustering, right? That each cluster is assumed to be of equal size and whereas in practice most data sets this will not be the case and we will come up with a solution to this in, in our probabilistic uh, framework actually. Now we can come up with some interesting points of improvement for uh, k-means clustering. Uh, first of all, uh, recall that this uh, error function that we minimize, so this j, is actually a sum over all my data points and the sum over all my clusters of z and k and then the Euclidean distance of xn to my cluster mean, my k cluster mean. And so this is a fu an error function which decomposes into a sum of individual errors that I make. So this also again makes it a candidate for stochastic uh, gradient descent for minimizing this particular thing. So that's nice. So also for this k-means clustering, we can apply stochastic gradient descent to minimize j, for example, to update our cluster means. So that gives me the following update rule. And in that way, I can come up with a very efficient algorithm that only considered uh, one data point at a time. Now, one issue that I pointed out in the previous slide is that this k-means clustering is based on uh, the Euclidean distance of, of a point to the cluster mean. And so what we could also do is consider other type of distances between points. And this actually results to uh, what is known to be the k medoids algorithm. So it follows the same structure as the k-means cluster. Uh, but now uh, my distance, my Euclidean distance can be replaced by any other um, this similarity measure or distance between uh, my, my, my points xn and, and clusters mu k. And in this way, we can also introduce distances that are less sensitive to outliers. Now, maybe you recall from previous videos that uh, this least squares minimization problem is highly sensitive to outliers, especially in the, the classification case where I'm dealing with uh, discrete data. Maybe also when my data isn't uh, nicely Euclidean, I can introduce different type of, uh, of distance metrics, essentially. Okay, so in summary, the k-means clustering algorithm, it is a very famous algorithm and it's widely used uh, primarily because it is so simple to implement and it is a very fast algorithm. But it also suffers from some uh, problems, right? Uh, first of all, we saw that 
it uh, only converges to local minima uh, so it does not provide a global optimal partitioning of my data um, we saw that the clusters that arise from uh, k-means clustering they are uh, sort of spherical right because of this euclidean distance and also the k-means clustering algorithm is sensitive to the scales of features and with that i mean the following suppose my data looks like this so i have let's say a two-dimensional data set of points which are maybe stretched in one direction so this distribution and we have another set of points stretched in the uh, along also the same direction then ideally you would want to cluster this uh, into these elongated clusters right uh, but what's happening with k-means clustering is again that we assume a Euclidean distance so we draw this circular clusters uh, at these points still they would be able to find this um, division between the data sets uh, but you can imagine that maybe uh, this algorithm is sensitive to changes along uh, this direction compared to uh, this direction. Now ideally you want your uh, clustering algorithm to take this anisotropic distance into account or alternatively we can uh, pre-process our data to make it isotropic and that's something that we will learn in uh, the lecture 10 uh, when we talk about principal component analysis we will introduce a whitening operator which turns this data set into uh, well isotropic point clouds. So we can turn this into isotropic features uh, via whitening operator and that makes it actually more the data more suitable to work with uh, k-means clustering. Um, another limitation of k-means clustering is um, that we have to choose the number of clusters in advance. Uh, so this requires some pre-knowledge from us so like okay I'm going to assume that there's k latent clusters in my data sets maybe because someone told me so or maybe i inspected the data and i roughly saw two point clouds okay but then there's also a lot of heuristics for automatically determine uh, the right amount of clusters k which we're not going to cover in in, in this course actually um, and then finally and this is what we're going to solve in the upcoming videos is that now the cluster assignments are hard and if you have overlap between the distributions then maybe you're not fully sure whether a point belongs either to the red class or to the blue class and we can deal with this uh, via a probabilistic uh, modeling approach and that's what we're going to discuss next using Gaussian mixture models. Before I proceed to uh, Gaussian mixture models, I like to briefly go over the method of Lagrange multipliers for solving constraint optimization problems. Um, in the upcoming video, we will be optimizing Gaussian mixture models, uh, and this involves a constraint optimization step. Moreover, uh, later on in this course, we will again encounter constraint optimization problems, which we will solve by the method of Lagrange multipliers. Uh, so it's worthwhile to take a moment and go over this method. Now the setting is that we're set out to find the maximum uh, location of this uh, function f. So f is the function that we're maximizing, but we're doing this subject to a constraint, which we're going to uh, denote as follows. Uh, and this is maybe abstractly put, but what you look at here, we say that my point x should lie on this level set, right? This g of x equals c represents a level set, so all the all the the values that are that takes some constant value that's actually denoted over here uh, but maybe let's make this a bit concrete um, so my g of x could be for example the function that takes the length of my vector x and we want this to be equal to some number so we're looking for points x uh, which have a particular length this could be a constraint right so this g of x can be thought of as this function that spits out the length for each possible x so this really is a function and um, setting it equal to c uh, creates this level set of points uh, that indeed all have the same uh, length all right uh, maybe we could make this a bit more uh, visual so let's say uh, so i'm now plotting my function g of x as some density right uh, so that's how i'm going to uh, plot this so give me a moment to draw this Okay, so this, this gray region could represent my function, my constraint uh, function g of x. Um, so maybe darker means a, a higher value or a lower value. Uh, but the idea is that then 
when we fix some C, we select all points which have the same value, right? So that creates this level set. So this level set then defines the points of X, uh, the points X that satisfy uh, this constraint. So we want our solution to lie somewhere on this red uh, level set encoded via my, well, constraint G of X is C. Okay, so that's uh, the constraint, but then we're mainly interested in finding the maximum of this particular function uh, f of x. Uh, so let me also make a drawing uh, of this. Okay, so suppose this orange-red region is the function that we want to maximize, and it has its maximum over here at this point. So darker means uh, higher values. So actually, my really my optimal location would be at this point. Uh, but now um, I am optimizing under this constraint, so I actually only am allowed to pick points on this red curve. Okay, and now the Lagrange multiplier method uh, provides me a way of finding this point, which really takes on the maximum value of this f of x, but still lies on this uh, constraint on this uh, level set. And the idea is as follows. Uh, first of all, we note uh, that this useful property that the gradient of g of x, the gradient of this function that defines my uh, constraint, is always perpendicular to, well, this constraint level set. That, that's really a property of level sets. So that's also nicely discussed in uh, the appendix E of the Book of Bishop. Actually, this entire Lagrange multiply method uh, can be found also in, in that uh, chapter. Um, but what it says really is that if I take uh, the gradient of G, so this will be the gradient of G, um, it, it always is perpendicular to this uh, level set. So wherever I look on this level set, the gradient of G is perpendicular to it. Then another uh, important observation to make is that at this constraint maximum, the gradient of F, so the function that we want to maximize, uh, this gradient should also point uh, perpendicular to this uh, constraint surface uh, because if I for example consider this point the gradient of f points in this direction so this would be the gradient of f and this actually means that I still have a component of this vector along this level set right because we if we want to optimize f so now we're talking about optimizing so this can be done via gradient ascent so we walk uphill towards the maximum so actually I want to move along this gradient and now the problem is constrained so I cannot make the step directly in this gradient direction but I could only move along my uh, level set along my constraint and since uh, this gradient still has a component uh, in this direction so I could actually move in this direction and that would optimize my function f so as long as this gradient isn't uh, perpendicular to um, well the gradient of, of g I am still able to move into a direction uh, that um, that optimizes f. So suppose you do that, then at this point the gradient again points in some direction which isn't fully perpendicular to my level set, so it allows me to move a bit in this direction. And at some point, really when there's no improvement anymore to make, then the gradient both of f and uh, the gradient of my um, constraint, they are either parallel or anti-parallel. Okay, so this tells us that at a constraint maximum, the gradient of f should also be perpendicular to the constraint surface. Otherwise, I would still have a component of this gradient uh, which isn't fully perpendicular to my level set and that would allow me to, well, update uh, my point x a little bit in the right direction. Um, but when they are both perpendicular, uh, then, well, I cannot further improve my, my function values anymore. Okay, so this means that at such an optimal location, uh, the gradient of f and the gradient of g are either parallel or anti-parallel, uh, but it doesn't mean that they have to be the same, right? Uh, they can point in different directions and they can have different lengths, uh, but it essentially means that there exists such a, a value lambda, such that the sum of these two uh, gradients equals zero. And this lambda value uh, will be called the Lagrange multiplier. So with that said, uh, we basically are saying that at such an optimal location x, we need to satisfy a disk constraint uh, for some optimal value lambda, which we are not sure yet what this value is, but there exists such a lambda such that a disk constraint is satisfied. Uh, 
And now it's going to be helpful to work with a so-called Lagrangian function. So this Lagrangian function is a function of x and lambda, um, which uh, basically is my function that I'm going to all multiply plus lambda times, uh, well, this is actually the constraint that we need to satisfy. Because then what you then see if we look for uh, stationary points of this Lagrangian function, so the points where the derivative with respect to x and with respect to lambda are both zero, that's a stationary point, so an optimal location, an optimal setting for x and lambda. We see that such a stationary point of my Lagrangian function uh, satisfies uh, my uh, original constraint, right? Because if this is satisfied, so let's say the derivative of x um, of this Lagrangian function, then this means I'm obtaining uh, this criterion, right? Uh, the derivative with respect to f gives me the gradient of f plus lambda times the gradient of g uh, of x. So that really results in this uh, particular constraint. And if we find a solution for uh, the second thing, so the derivative to, uh, to lambda of my Lagrangian function, then this really implies that um, my constraint really, uh, the constraint is satisfied because the derivative of uh, my Lagrangian with respect to lambda will give me g of x minus c, which we set equal to zero. So that defines a stationary point, And that gives me this equation. So we see uh, we can introduce a Lagrangian function. And if we find an optimal location in this Lagrangian function with respect to x and lambda, we have solved our constraint uh, optimization problem. Okay, so it's probably helpful to take a look at some concrete example. Um, so the situation is as follows. So we're set out to maximize this function of two uh, variables, a function of x1 and x2, and it looks like this. And it's uh, graphically depicted over here with these blue um, contours. And then we have this constraint, uh, which is encoded as follows. So we have the constraint that x1 plus x2 minus 1 should equal to 0. So again, let's make this drawing. So f of x is the function that we want to optimize and we see immediately for x1 and x2 equals zero, then this thing is uh, maximal, right? Because for every deviation from zero, this thing will get smaller. So um, this function is concentrated uh, around zero. Uh, so let me make again the same drawing with these uh, sort of density plots. Okay, so darker means a uh, higher value, right? So uh, this red orange colored plot represents my function that I want to optimize and really the optimal location is right at uh, the point x1, x2 is zero, uh, but we're not allowed to select this point because we need to find points that lie on this uh, constraint uh, surface or this constraint level set. Um, and so this level set is obtained by taking a look at uh, g uh, of x1 and x2, right? So let me also make a plot of that. So this g of x is really a, a linear function, right? Which has a certain uh, direction. So along this direction, we have an increase of, uh, of g of x. So the, the gradient of, so this is the gradient of g always points in, in this uh, particular direction. And let's again take a look at um, this intuition of, of, of Lagrange multipliers. So the gradient of f points in this direction. So that actually means if I select this point, I could still improve my function values f by moving in this direction. I'm not fully allowed to move in this direction, but I am still allowed to move along this, um, this level set. So basically the next optimal point uh, will be this thing. And if I look at this location, my gradient points somewhere in this direction. So I still have this component uh, on, along my level set, which allows me to move, move in this direction. But really at some point, uh, my gradient points in the same direction as the gradient of uh, my, my constraint function. And then there's no way that I can improve my function values uh, f anymore by, by moving along this line. So this, this is again a recap of uh, really this constraint, right? So we just again showed that at such an optimal location, the gradient of x uh, is aligned with the gradient of, of, of g with some multiplier lambda because delta g and delta f are not necessarily the same so they can have different lengths and different uh, signs but at least their directions are the same so there exists such a lambda for which uh, these two gradients uh, are the same so that was the principle of this uh, method of Lagrange multiplier so um, 
we define then this Lagrangian function because then if we compute the stationary points of this function, we actually found our solution. So this is the Lagrange function that we're now going to define where this thing over here is my function f of x1 and x2 and this thing over here is lambda times g of x minus c but c is uh, zero in this example right so this is then uh, my lagrangian uh, function and then we're going to look for the optimizers uh, of this function so we take the derivative with respect to x1 x2 and lambda set it to zero and then solve this system of equations for x1 x2 and lambda okay so let's do this uh, the derivative uh, with respect to x1 we see an x1 over here so that gives me minus 2x1 we see an x1 over here the derivative will give me plus lambda so this directly tells me that x1 is going to be um, lambda over 2 uh, the same here in the x2 case we find this uh, uh, equation if we solve it we get x2 is also lambda over 2 and if we take the derivative with respect to lambda so that gives me this constraint uh, function really and um, we can now fill in the x1 and x2 that we just uh, derived and that tells me that lambda equals 1. Okay, so this tells me that the optimizer of this constraint optimization problem is given by the following. So x1 takes on the value a half, x2 takes on the value a half and this lambda was used as, as an aid in deriving this solution essentially. Okay, so that describes the method of Lagrange multipliers for uh, solving constraint optimization problems. So the recipe is uh, define the function that you want to, to optimize and also write your constraint in the following formula as a function g of x equals uh, some c and then with this you can define such a Lagrangian function so f of x plus lambda times g of x minus c and once you have defined such a Lagrangian function then only thing that is left is look for uh, the stationary points. So set the derivative of x to zero, set the derivative of lambda to zero, solve it, and that will give you your constraint uh, solution. In this video, we are again going to adopt a probabilistic viewpoint on machine learning. Now in the setting of unsupervised learning via latent variable models. We are going to assume that the data is distributed via a mixture of Gaussians and it turns out that with such a viewpoint on the data distribution, we obtain a probabilistic variation of the k-means clustering algorithm. Now the idea is as follows, so we have this, this data, unlabeled data, so we only have uh, measurements x, uh, but we assume they are distributed via some probability distribution that is composed out of a mixture of Gaussians, like some points come from one of those Gaussian distributions which have a certain mean and variance and some points come from, a, from another distribution. And now we're going to model this in the generative setting. So recall from the, the classification videos that this uh, generative modeling is, is the most, is the broadest class of probabilistic modeling, right? Because it's, um, well, the goal is to end up with a model for the probability distribution uh, from which these data points X are drawn. So that means once I have such a description of the probability distribution, I can generate new data samples. So that's the generative aspect of things. Uh, but we also have been obtaining such models via marginalization process. So we assume uh, that there is such a latent variable, so the three different classes. And then my probability distribution over X is obtained by marginalizing out this latent variable uh, Z. And what we did so far is we factorized this. So we said that this joint uh, can be obtained by the product of these latent variable conditional distributions. So uh, what is the probability of observing an X if I know that I'm looking at uh, my latent variable uh, Z times uh, the prior or the, the probability for observing any of such uh, Z at all. And note that this is similar to what we've been doing in the classification uh, case, right? Where we also worked with such a uh, class conditional distribution. So the probability of observing a particular X, if I know that this data point came from the class, uh, well, uh, Z in this case, in combination with a prior probability for observing that particular class at all. Now we work in the unlabeled data setting. So we do not really know which classes there are, but we're just going to assume there is such a ordering or structuring in my, in my data where each data point came from one of the latent variables. 
uh, and uh, maybe some of the such latent variables are more likely to occur than others. So we make the splitting as follows. So these would be my uh, latent variable conditional distributions and this would be the prior for the latent variable. And then just as in the classification case, once we have obtained such a, a latent variable conditional distribution and we have these latent variable uh, priors, we can obtain via Bayes rule also the posterior uh, probabilities for observing this latent variable given my observation x. Okay, now let's go over what I just described, but now uh, graphically. So, um, first of all, this is our data. So we have all these measurements, x, without any label, any information on the latent variable. So we just color code it here in, in purple or pink. Um, so these are just my data points, but I'm going to make this modeling choice, right? I say that uh, this data actually comes from such a joint distribution of a point x and a particular latent variable uh, z. So that's essentially, so we say that this, in this plot, the data comes from my distribution P of X, but we make this a breakdown. So we say that actually we're observing a data point X together with their latent variable class, which is drawn from this joint uh, distribution. So whenever we observe a data point, we think of it as it actually belongs to a particular class. So the blue, the blue class, for example, or it, it belongs to, to, to the green class. So every time I observe a data point X and actually also maybe such a latent variable. So that's color coded here, a point with a color. Uh, but then when we do this marginalization, we discard uh, this color or this uh, latent variable and we just end up with these uh, points. So that's sort of a modeling approach. And then we split this joint probability distribution into these latent variable conditional distributions and well, the prior for that uh, latent variable. Where my latent variable distributions are assumed to be Gaussians with a certain uh, mean and a certain uh, standard deviation or a covariance matrix. And then we assume a Gaussian distribution for each of these uh, latent variable uh, classes. So what's indicated here in blue is basically saying a data point a blue is drawn from this uh, class conditional or this latent variable conditional distribution. Um, let's say Z is uh, blue. So really what this says, it says that uh, my final data distribution is obtained as a mixture of Gaussians, right? Each Gaussian has its mean and uh, covariance matrix. So those are uh, these conditional probability distributions. And we are weighting these distributions with a particular probability for observing that particular uh, latent variable. So these will be called the mixing coefficients in the end. And these are my Gaussians. So that gives a Gaussian mixture model. Okay. And then uh, because we adopt such a generic, a generative model, we can also infer the, the, the posterior probabilities of observing a particular uh, data point set, right? So um, that's color coded to you. So these are the posterior probabilities from my latent variable given my observation X. Meaning if I observe a particular X, I can check for the probability uh, that it belong to uh, Z is one, Z is two, or Z is three. And I'm going to color code that in this particular plot. So if a point clearly come, came from the blue class, it's, it's colored blue. When it came from the green class, it's, it's green, um, according to my uh, probabilistic model. Uh, but when I'm uncertain, I'm going to mix these colors. Like I'm going to mix the ink that uh, sort of generated these uh, colors. So that's graphically depicted over here. So in, es in essence, this is a sort of K a soft version of the K-means clustering method, right? Because I, now if I have a new data point, I assign a probability of it belonging to one of the classes. I'm not going to say this belongs to the blue class. I'm just going to say with this probability, it belongs to the blue uh, class. Okay, so that's the setting of this Gaussian mixture model. Uh, we can use it. Um, well, to model our data distribution and then run it in a generative setting to generate new data points that sort of follow the distribution that we have been observing so far. But we can also use it uh, for, uh, let's say, cluster assignments in a soft probabilistic way. Okay, so then essentially what we're doing is we made these observations of these data points and then we're going, we're going to model the distribution that may have generated this data point, right? So we are going to parameterize our probability distribution in the following way. So uh, well, that's just explained. So we explain this with a Gaussian distribution and this with just a probability, just a number uh, for observing this particular latent variable. 
and I'm going to describe in detail how we're going to model these distributions. But once we have such a model for the distributions, uh, we can of course maximize the likelihood of uh, my uh, distribution actually describing this data. So again, once we have a probabilistic model, we can optimize it so we can tune all these parameters um, via the maximum likelihood approach. So that's really the principle that we're going to stick to and that's what we're going to do again today. So we're constructing this probabilistic model uh, P of X and we're going to model these uh, conditionals with Gaussians and these distributions uh, essentially with uh, generalized Bernoulli distributions just like we've done before also in this generative uh, classification setting. Okay, so let's go over our modeling approach. Uh, first of all, we assume that we're dealing with discrete latent variables, which really means that I'm going to assume that there are only k clusters or k classes that describe my model. Uh, I'm going to factorize uh, my distribution with only k, in this example, three uh, different classes. That, that is what it means. Uh, so this is a discrete variable that only can take on the value 0 or 1. So my data point can only belong to one of these uh, clusters. Right, so then I need uh, to describe this probability distribution for the probability that my data point belongs to this particular class, meaning so that zk equals 1. And I'm going to model that with just this number, uh, like we've done before in the classification setting. So this pi k is really the probability of observing my uh, k class. Okay, so this number should represent a probability, so it should take on a value between 0 and 1. And also, because we consider this as a probability, the sum over all my k classes uh, should equal to 1, right? So this really imposes a constraint, which we have to deal with uh, later on when we actually start to find, uh, optimize for these particular values uh, by k, because these are now my model parameters, right? Then I'm going to model the clusters uh, with Gaussians, meaning that these cluster conditional distributions are going to be modeled uh, with Gaussian distributions. Again, so these kind of distributions are going to be modeled with Gaussians and each Gaussian has a particular mean and it has a particular covariance matrix which defines the shape of uh, this distribution. And of course then with these two uh, modeling choices together, so we have a prior and these cluster conditionals, we can obtain the joint probability distribution for observing an X together with a particular um, cluster label or value for the, the latent variable. So it's, it's going to be the, the product of my uh, cluster or a latent variable conditional distributions, which we modeled with a Gaussian, and then the product with these uh, priors, which we modeled with uh, these numbers uh, by K. And then with these two components, uh, we have everything in place to construct a generative model, right? So in the end, we were uh, modeling our distribution for the data point X, which can be obtained uh, via this joint probability for X with the latent variable, the unobserved uh, latent class, let's say, um, yeah, via this marginalization process, right? So we can run this in the generative setting. And um, let me explain that what I mean with that. So we can generate new data points by first drawing a latent variable according to my uh, prior distribution, which I'm now modeling. I have these pi k's. So with probability pi k, I select, well, the k uh, cluster. Then I'm going to use this k cluster to generate a new data point given my uh, cluster conditionals or my latent conditional points. And that then would give me a point somewhere, um, well, in line with the distribution that I uh, had observed so far. So running this in a generative setting would mean I randomly pick a color according to my uh, priors, a blue, uh, green or red, and then suppose I pick the red point, and then I'm going to uh, generate a data point according to my Gaussian distribution, and it gives me a point maybe somewhere over here. So then we generated a new data point. Okay, so that explains the generative aspect of things, uh, but maybe we are also interested in inferring uh, the posterior probabilities for my latent variables. So this is actually um, inferring the latent cluster, meaning that if I made an observation for a point X, I can assign probabilities to this point belonging to one of these unobserved clusters. And this follows from Bayes' rule, right? So we have this uh, cluster conditional uh, times the prior uh, divided by uh, the, the evidence, so my marginalized distribution. So um, 
if you write this out, it's as follows. So this P of X can be obtained by the marginalization over my clusters. So now here indexed uh, with a J. So this is actually my joint probability distribution factorized, factorized in these two uh, components. So, and if we then insert our uh, modeling choices, so we said the priors were modeled with some uh, number pi k and the conditionals were uh, modeled with Gaussian distributions, then this is really uh, the formula for obtaining my conditional, uh, my posterior probability for, um, well, my observed data point x belonging to one of the, the latent uh, clusters. And for convenience, really, we're going to introduce this new symbol, gamma. So this, this gamma will be called uh, the responsibility. So really the responsibility, responsibility that class K takes for explaining data point X. Okay, so that's an, a symbol that we introduced now, this gamma set K is essentially the posterior probability for uh, my, my k class given my observation x and it will be called the responsibility. The responsibility that my k class uh, takes for explaining data point x. And in a way it's something like this. When I observe a new data point x, if it's close to point blue, then uh, the blue class is pretty certain and says, yeah, I'm pretty sure that this belongs to my class. So I take this high responsibility for this point. But if my point is somewhere between classes, then both classes, uh, produce a low posterior probability and in that sense take a low responsibility for this particular point. Um, but either way this name uh, responsibility really refers to uh, the posterior probability. Okay so we have such a probabilistic model and we have observed our data points right and well we can model uh, now my distributions uh, which the, with these uh, pi's and the, the mu and the sigmas of my uh, uh, Gaussian distributions but I still have to set those, right? So I have this uh, probabilistic model and now I want to infer what parameters are most optimal, uh, which parameters lead to the distribution that most likely explain my data. So with this in place, I can define the log likelihood and we're going to maximize this um, in order to find the optimal parameters uh, that describe my data. So we've done this uh, many times before. So we define our probability distribution. We have our data, so we can define uh, the likelihood and we can define the log likelihood. And um, so we make this IID assumption again that each data point was drawn from the distribution that we're actually uh, modeling. So then we can make uh, this factorization over all my individual uh, data points. Now, the log of this factorization results in the sum of all these log likelihoods for the individual data points. Uh, but now things get tricky uh, because so far uh, our distributions were relatively simple. It was just an exponential or some other distribution and then the log of this thing gave, gave us something nice. But now we're considering this mixture of Gaussian. So actually we, we have to take the log of a sum of different components. And this is something that we can no longer analytically write out. So really because of this sum over here, the log of the sum of these components, I cannot further, let me write it down. I cannot further simplify this because of the sum. So what now? How are we going to maximize this log likelihood? Now we're going to do this via the expectation maximization algorithm. So we're going to iteratively improve our log likelihood and I'm going to explore, uh, explain that in the upcoming slides. Okay, so this is what we're set out to do. We're going to maximize the likelihood with respect to my uh, model parameters. And so this is the likelihood, the log likelihood actually. So let me write this down. This is the log of the likelihood of my entire data set. So I'm going to abbreviate it with P of uh, capital X. And what we've been doing so far, uh, we maximize this by uh, looking for the stationary points of my log likelihood. And that means that if I, for example, want to optimize uh, with respect to my parameter mu k, I take the derivative of mu k of my log likelihood and set it to zero and then solve it for mu k. But now because we have this complicated expression, so uh, the log of the sum of all these components, I can no longer find a nice expression for mu k because if I take this derivative, I still have something that... Um, depends on all my other parameters. 
But what I could do, and this is the trick behind the expectation maximization algorithm, I can, I can write my uh, solution from UK. So, well, it is some expression and I'm going to keep it still as a function of these responsibilities, ZNK. So that's the essential approach uh, behind it. So I cannot find a nice closed form solution from UK because this, if I take this derivative, set this to zero, uh, solve it from UK, I still have something which depends on mu k, sigma k, and the other parameters. Uh, but it turns out that we can group all the remaining parameters into this responsibility term. So this responsibility term still depends on my other parameters. So on pi k, on uh, even on mu k, and uh, the sigma k's. But what I'm going to do in this expectation uh, maximization algorithm, I'm going to fix uh, these uh, these posterior probabilities or these responsibilities, and then solve for my mu k's and all the other parameters. So and then I have obtained these new parameters, I can update my responsibilities, and then again. Uh, again, iterate this uh, solution, this maximization step and solve for uh, the parameters. And I think in the, the upcoming uh, slides, it will become clear what I actually mean with this derivation step and how this uh, scheme works. But the general structure is uh, we can eventually find local minima of this uh, highly non-convex optimization problem by alternating the following step. So we can update the expected posterior so this isn't our final posterior yet but we call it the expected posterior so given my current parameters I can evaluate these posterior distributions or these posterior uh, probabilities. So that's like an assignment step right each data point is assigned to one of the k classes uh, via these posterior uh, probabilities. And then once we made this assignment we can actually just fill in the, the solutions that we derive from mu k as a function of these uh, posteriors, as a function of these responsibilities. And that gives us the pi case, the mu case, and the sigma case, so my model parameters that maximize um, my log likelihood for a fixed uh, posterior. So in a bit more detail, the expectation maximization algorithm is as follows. So I said we are going to maximize the log likelihood. This log likelihood is a complicated function uh, because if we adopt the strategy that we've been doing so far, let's look for stationary points, then we cannot find a closed form expression from mu k, but we find something that depends on uh, these gammas, on these posteriors. Now, this is a preview of what is coming up. So I am going to derive how to obtain these mu k's, these pi k's, and how to express this in, in terms of these, uh, these gammas. But this is a preview that shows that we can actually find this mu case in terms of this gamma. The same for the sigmas. So we are able to find such expressions. So that means that we can actually iteratively update our model parameters. So once we know, uh, once we have evaluated our posterior distribution, so once we have made this assignment during the expected step, we can update our model parameters, mu k, pi k, sigma k. And once we've updated our model parameters, we can update our uh, posteriors. And we keep on iterating this. And this actually gives us then a algorithm which is very similar to what we've been doing in the k-means clustering algorithm. And it is as follows. So we first initialize uh, the pi k's, the mu k, and the sigma k. So let's just initialize it with just some random mean and some isotropic uh, covariance matrix. Okay, so then with these initial parameters, I can perform the E step. I can update the expected posterior. So I can update the expected posterior, gamma, Z, and K. So this gamma refers to the posterior probability of a data point uh, X belonging to that particular class, right? So that's color coded here. So we can make these soft assignments with uh, a certain probability, uh, let's say this point belongs to the blue class and also with a certain probability it belongs to the red class. And in this particular case, we get a sort of mixing of these colors uh, because there isn't a very strong assignment that we can make. Okay, so now we have updated our gammas and once we have done that, we can move on to the maximization step. So the step that actually maximizes uh, my log likelihood via uh, the, <coughs> the following update rule. So that's the maximization step. 
which basically says that I'm now going to find my new model parameter, so the mean of my Gaussian distribution and its covariance matrix, such that it is most likely describing this particular set of points that are probably belonging to uh, the blue class. Okay, so then we have these new model parameters. Then again, we can update our posterior probabilities of a particular data point belonging to this class. And that gives me this new uh, expected uh, uh, update step, right? And then with these new gammas, I can uh, again obtain uh, my new model parameters in this maximization step. And then I'm iterating this expectation maximization steps until I uh, converged uh, to something nice. And at this point, it's maybe worthwhile to point out that this expectation maximization algorithm for Gaussian mixture modules, uh, models is actually much slower than the k-means clustering because here, only after 20 of such iterations, I am able to find a uh, configuration that doesn't change anymore uh, between uh, succeeding steps, steps. Now I'll get back to this uh, point of slow convergence uh, later on. But this essentially described the expectation maximization step. Um, so this was a preview and I haven't really showed how to derive uh, this maximization step, how to derive uh, these expressions. So that's what I'm going to do next. So we set out to maximize the log likelihood. We take the derivative of this thing, set it to zero, and then uh, define our solution in terms of these uh, posterior probabilities. And I'm going to start off with deriving this expression uh, from mu k. Uh, so let's do that. And before we get there, I want to make this following remark, which is a recurring uh, thing in the upcoming derivation that, well, first of all, we are working with multivariate, uh, multivariate Gaussians uh, to model our conditional distributions. So for a given class k, I model the probability of observing an x with, with such a Gaussian. And now I'm going to take the derivative uh, with respect to mu k of, of this Gaussian. And really here I want to show that the derivative of such a Gaussian is again a Gaussian multiplied uh, with this uh, front vector, with this particular vector. And you can imagine where this comes from, right? Because this Gaussian is this exponential and the derivative of an exponential is the exponential itself times the derivative of the things inside the exponent. So that leads to the fact that I'm seeing this Gaussian again. That's uh, because of the exponent. And then we have this term over here, and that's because of the derivative inside uh, the exponent. And this follows from taking the derivative delta mu k of a half x minus mu k transpose inverse covariance x minus mu k. And we've computed these uh, derivatives uh, before in the exercise classes. Uh, so essentially this derivative is given by um, a half times x minus mu. In the previous videos, we covered unsupervised learning with discrete latent variable models. In the upcoming videos, we will consider continuous latent variable models instead. And before we move on to a full probabilistic interpretation of such models, uh, we start off with a non-probabilistic version of it. Today we will talk about principal component analysis. It is a method for dimensionality reduction, which can be derived via several principles. Now in this video, we will derive principal component analysis via a maximum variance formulation. And in the next videos, we will derive it using a minimal reconstruction error viewpoint and a probabilistic viewpoint. Now the main goal of such continuous latent variable models really is dimensionality reduction. So the goal is dimensionality reduction. Um, where we treat our data, so our data lives in a high dimensional space. For example, my image can be of 100 by 100 pixels, uh, but we're going to assume that actually the, the true underlying data structure is of lower dimension. And maybe this is best explained by an example such as uh, the following. So let's say we are observing these images of a tree and this tree is generated by uh, well, by, by shifting it, so by translating it a, li a little bit to the right or to the, uh, to the top, uh, rotate it a little bit. So we have all these images that uh, represent a tree and this tree is rotated and translated. Now, the images in itself are highly high dimensional, right? So they're 100 by 100, so let's say 10,000 pixels and each pixel value can take on really any value on the real line. 
But so if I were to generate one random image, I would have so many possibilities for, uh, I could pick a value for each of these 10,000 values. Uh, so that's what we see. We see all these images consisting of these 10,000 pixel values, but we see a lot of similarities uh, between these images, right? And now, especially in this particular case, once you realize that all these images are a tree, it's just that they're translated and, and rotated, uh, this actually means that if I have one core representation, this particular tree, then actually my latent space only consists of three parameters. So that would be the, trans the two, two translation parameters and one rotation parameter. So if I have this core representation of the tree, then I can generate any of these images with just three values. Now that's the idea about dimensionality reduction. Uh, we assume that there is such a structure that actually my data comes from a lower dimensional space and what we observe may be high dimensional but intrinsically it, it's, it's of low dimension and we want to recover this particular uh, manifold or this particular low dimensional description of the data. Now of course this is a very simplistic example right but the idea of such lower dimensional uh, manifolds it makes sense and it works in a lot of applications but if we stick for example to this uh, digit recognition uh, example uh, we could consider the latent space to be much bigger, right? Uh, there's so much variations uh, that take place. Uh, we could consider scaling, for example. Uh, we could consider not just the digit tree, but all digits uh, zero to nine. We could consider different colors and different handwriting styles, and, and this goes on, right? But still, even if you consider all those variations that you can expect, then it's very probable that the, the number of latent variables will still be much fewer than the, the 10,000 dimensions that my images really have so the, the, the size of this vector space so it makes sense to proceed in, into this direction of dimensionality uh, reduction right now in this example uh, the latent space is a non-linear transformation of the image right because i cannot just uh, transform like a scaling parameter in one step to an image it probably is a very complicated model to do so but in principle this is how we could treat it so we're searching for this uh, latent subspace uh, which we can then transform to our final observation. So these actual digits via some model and this model can be highly nonlinear. Uh, maybe that uh, I'll, I'll cover that a little bit in, in uh, video 10.4. Uh, but for now, we really stick with latent variable models uh, that represent a linear embedding of my data. And later we consider the generalizations uh, to, uh, to the nonlinear case. So that's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to find a linear projection of the data and we're going to do it in such a way that the variance of this projected data is maximal. So what we're essentially after in this principal component analysis framework with this maximal variance approach is that we, we have this high dimensional data. So we have points in a high dimensional space and we observe variations in several directions. And our task is to, to recover these uh, principal directions, these principal component among which the variation is, is maximal. So, so the idea is that we, uh, for example, measure high dimensional uh, vectors. Uh, I can only draw this in 2D now, so 2 is high dimensional in this case. So we have all these measurements and we want to reduce these 2D measurements to just a 1D uh, component. Uh, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, the axis of maximal variation. For example, if I take a look at this data, it's elongated in one structure. So we have a lot of variation in this direction little variation in this direction. So if I'm going to make a projection, um, it's best I do it along this direction and uh, maybe not so relevant to do it along this direction. So our objective now is to recover these axes of uh, maximal variations and these axes will be called principal components. So this is again summarized over here, maybe now in a bit more detail. So I have this data set of, of points, obser these observations which lie in some d-dimensional space. Again, here's a 2D uh, visualization. So these are my uh, 2D observed uh, data points. And now I want to project this to a lower dimensional space. So I want to project it on this line. So now a 2D point is represented with a 1D point somewhere on this line. And this projections will, uh, will be done via orthogonal projections, right? So if I have this data point, I look for the closest point on this direction, on this line, and that will be my new embedding. And then my objective is to find this direction among which uh, the, the variation in my point is large. So if I look at this, I have uh, variation is large. Uh, 
And of course, this is a relative notion of variance. So let me pick another direction for to compare it with. Suppose I picked this direction. So this will would have been my, my uh, U1. Now, if I project the points to this uh, particular line, uh, then this point ends up over here, this point somewhere over here, uh, this one over here, this one over here. Then along this line, I actually have a, a smaller variation in comparison to the projection to this uh, purple line over here, indicated in green, this variance. So my objective now is to find a direction U1 uh, that results in a maximum ver variance of the projected points onto this uh, line. Okay, so that is going to be my objective. And then instead of, so now this was a, a 2D to 1D mapping, an example, but in general, we consider D-dimensional uh, data points and we're going to project it to M-dimensional um, hypersurfaces or lower dimensional uh, spaces, where M is assumed to be given. And now, we, before we proceed, I just want to recap some uh, basic definitions that we've seen many times, actually. So the mean is defined as, as follows. So we indicate it with uh, an overline X. So that will indicate the mean over all my data points. And then we have a covariance matrix obtained in the following way. And such a covariance matrix is then uh, given to be symmetric and positive definite. And these are some properties which we will uh, use later on. Okay, now let's try to build this up from a simple concepts. And we start off with a 1D projection. So my data is D-dimensional, and I want to project my data now onto this uh, one-dimensional line using this as a direction vector. Then the projection of such a data point onto this vector, so it's simply given by taking this, this inner product, the scalar product, uh, this essentially gives me a single value, right? It gives me a scalar value which I'm going to know with Zn1, and it's just a single value. Okay, and then we can also obtain uh, the mean of all these projections simply by uh, projecting the mean itself. And this actually directly follows from um, linearity of, of, of the mean. And with this, I mean, if I take the expectation over my uh, new um, projected values, I could do that by, of course, taking the expected value over these uh, projections. But by linearity of this expectation, I can take this uh, projection vector outside and order it in the following way. So you see, we can also first compute the mean of my data and then project it. Okay, but that, that's just a useful property. So what we're really after was this direction vector u1 and also really the length of a direction isn't too important. Actually, we're only interested in the direction itself, right? So we're going to search for uh, direction vectors u1, which have a length one. So we normalize this, uh, this direction vector. Okay, so the objective is to find the vectors u1 that really result in a projection with maximal uh, variance. So uh, let's take a look at the variance of the projected data. So the variance of this uh, projected component Okay, so that's given here, right? So the, the, the average over the, the square distance of each projection to its mean. And we can see we can write it out into a convenient form. So first by starting off recognizing that this U1 uh, can be factorized in the following way. So then we have this form. And if we then write it out, so we expand the square, uh, we see that we can write it in the, in the following way because this is a scalar product uh, between two vectors and I can change the order by putting a transpose and moving this to the left, put a transpose there, and that gives me this term uh, multiplied with, well, the term that I already have. So this is nothing else as rewriting. And then because these u1s do not uh, depend on my index n, I, I can keep the, I can pull this sum inside, and that gives me the following. And this